Welcome everybody to this symposium. Um, I'm Miranda Forsyth, an Associate Professor here at the ANU and the Director of the Centre for Restorative Justice. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the traditional lands on which the university sits, those of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. It's humbling to reflect that the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people have been caring for these lands for over 25,000 years. We would also like to pay our respects to their elders past and present, and also acknowledge the traditional lands across Australia from which the participants are joining us today. We've got a lot to learn from Indigenous Australian approaches to justice based on a relational understanding of justice. And hopefully this symposium is a small step in our journey towards this. In the course of preparation for the event, we've been asked to organise a future panel of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women to speak to this very important subject. This is seen as being paramount to place us on the map towards a consolatory example of what respect, reconciliation and recognition is. And we're of course very happy to organise this. We've been delighted by the interest and enthusiasm generated by this symposium with over 200 people registered to attend. The aim of the symposium really is to both highlight and explore the role that restorative justice can play in addressing the needs of survivors of sexual assault, particularly in the ACT. Given the current deserved focus on this issue, we thought that now is an opportune moment to have such a conversation about what pathways to restorative justice are currently open and which other ones could be developed and if so, how. Restorative justice is an approach to harm that focuses on healing. It's also one that seeks to recognise that survivors and those who have been harmed are often embedded in our community and that community support, resources and insights are therefore often needed to move forward. As such, questions about restorative justice also require us to think creatively about the relationships between the community and the criminal justice system and the places that justice needs can be addressed. Restorative justice is certainly not the only place that such needs can be met, and we are not by any means um, seeking to say that today. We are just saying that it is part of the justice ecosystem that deserves to be considered. So we encourage everyone today to approach our discussions with a generous and creative mindset, opening, open to imagining new and better pathways for survivors. I'd like to hand over to Professor Meredith Rosner to do some of the housekeeping for today's event. Thanks so much, Miranda, um, and thanks for all of your work on this. And also, just before I do a few housekeeping, I want to thank the organizers and the panelists for their enthusiasm and their dedication. Um, I echo Miranda's um, excitement and enthusiasm that, that people are so interested in having this discussion. And really, all of our panelists um, have been so responsive and worked so hard to, to make this day come off, so thank you. And in particular, I wanna thank the ANU support team who's really made this event possible. That's Naomi Snowball, Perry Chapman, Hannah Robinson, Helen Taylor, and Adam Spence. So as will be obvious to you now, this symposium is running in a webinar format. In a moment, I'll introduce Dr. Marisa Patterson, who will make some opening remarks, and we'll then hold four different panels that will explore what restorative justice in response to sexual assault currently looks like in the ACT, what are the different needs that survivors may have, examples of restorative pathways in other jurisdictions, and finally, what are the operational and legislative challenges that we currently face. The facilitator of each panel will very briefly introduce the participants before facilitating a discussion. At the end of each panel, there will be time for questions and further discussion, followed by a short break. Because we have so much ground to cover today, we will be keeping to strict time. If you want to ask a question of a panel, we ask that you use the Q&A function, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Our moderators will review and collate the questions and present them to the panelists. We also ask if you could please include your affiliation before you type out your question. And if you do not wish to use your name when asking a question, please specify this to the moderator. 
Now, of course, we recognize that those of us in the ACT and those of us who are joining from other parts in Australia or New Zealand are currently at home in lockdown. And that means that we all have competing pressures on our time. Um, and, and we recognize that and understand that that might have to lead to a more sort of fluid webinar and people will have to be moving in and out. And that's that's fine. Finally, just to um, mention that this webinar is being recorded and that the recording can be paused if requested. And please um, send a message to the moderator if, if that is a request that you have. So without further ado, I'd like to warmly welcome Dr. Marisa Patterson, who will open this event. Marisa is a member from Murrumbidgee in the ACT Legislative Assembly. She was also formerly our colleague here at the ANU, where she was the director of the Center for Gambling Research. Marisa is deeply committed to social justice and to helping survivors of sexual violence, and we're just so pleased to have her here today. So over to you, Marisa. Thank you very much, Meredith. Um, I would also like to begin by acknowledging uh, the Ngunnawal people on whose lands we meet today and pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge um, any sexual assault survivors here today and say enough is enough. I thought I would outline my journey to get to this point today that I am, very, I am a very interested participant in today's symposium. Sexual assault reform is something that's very important to me and something that I am a strong advocate for. Broad scale community cultural change is needed. We need action. We need legislative reform, evidence based prevention programs, education and awareness, increased victim support with the ultimate goal of long term cultural change. However, we also need innovative thinking. We need new ideas to solve this very serious problem in our community. In all my work with stakeholders and with constituents on the ground, both men and women, the message is coming through loud and clear that we are at a critical junction. Since February this year, a seismic shift occurred in Australia. When Brittany Higgins disclosed on national TV that she was allegedly raped at Parliament House, the nation went into free fall. Allegation after allegation of rape, sexual harassment, unprofessional behaviour to say the least, was exposed exposed an entrenched culture of misogyny at Parliament House. Further to this, Chanel Contos started an online petition in New South Wales that went viral with hundreds of young people, school children, uh, young people and school children disclosing sexual assault stemming from a sexu sexist culture entrenched in Sydney's elite private schools. News reports daily featured disclosures of sexual assault and harassment in our parliaments, institutions and workplaces. The media, in particular female journalists in this country, should be commended for their reporting of these stories, relentlessly pursuing the truth and holding those in powerful leadership positions accountable. In March this year, tens of thousands of women and men marched for justice at Parliament House here in Canberra and around the country, crying enough is enough. The voices of women marginalised, women powerless, including the voice of a woman from the grave, were held up, were heard and were believed. I was elected in October last year and one of the things I'm most driven to see and most passionate about is law reform around the definition of consent. Since January, I've been working with the Parliamentary Council Office of the ACT to draft legislation to amend the Crimes Act in the ACT to a communicative model of consent. In June, I publicly released a draft, a draft amendment bill for public comment. I received very detailed and informed feedback from a range of key stakeholders and overwhelming support for the bill and the submissions and more broadly in the feedback from the community. I've taken that feedback on board and presented that to the ACT Sexual Assault Prevention and Response Program, which includes a law reform working group. This program is currently in progress and I commend Minister Berry for moving so quickly and urgently earlier on in this year to establish a whole of government approach to addressing sexual assault and sexual violence in the ACT. A strong criminal justice response for sexual offending is important not just for victim survivors, but also for the entire community. And I feel very passionately about the need for a legislated communicative model of consent. We can have all the best education and prevention programs in the world. However, if the law does not reflect what has been taught in those programs and more broadly society's expectations, 
then I think we end up never progressing past this point. However, I also believe that law reform is only one part of the steps that need to be taken to address sexual violence in our community. 86% of victims of sexual assault in the ACT were women. This is largely a gendered issue. However, the statistics suggest that the vast majority of sexual assaults happen at the hands of a perpetrator that is known to the victim. And at a national level, the Personal Safety Survey of Australia found that this is the case for 87% of sexual assaults. These are not random acts of violence. They are calculated, victims are groomed, manipulated, and this happens within the broader context of people's everyday lives and relationships, which I think changes how we, we may respond. The most commonly known perpetrator type was that was a previous partner, followed closely by a boyfriend or a date. An estimated 40% of women who experienced sexual assault were assaulted in their own home. A further 17% were assaulted in the perpetrator's home and a 13% were assaulted in another person's home. 86% of women assaulted did not contact police. Of those who did report to a police, police approximately 3.5% saw convictions. Half of all women who experienced sexual assault sought advice or support for that incident. And of those, 71% sought that advice from a friend or family member. Over half of these women who experienced sexual assault felt anxiety and fear for the, their personal safety in the 12 months after that most recent incident. To summarise these statistics, women are predominantly sexually assaulted by someone they know in their own home. They do not contact police. They may talk to a trusted friend or family member and they feel long-term impacts of anxiety or fear for their personal safety. Now let's flip this. The perpetrator, what does he look like? He looks like someone you know. He knows his victim. He knows where she lives. He likely knows her friends and family. He likely has a pretty good hunch she won't call the police. As a society, we don't critique how he manipulated her, how many drinks he bought her, how he put immense pressure on her to go home, especially to her house where perhaps she thought she might feel more control and more safe. The perpetrators of this violence in our community need to be put squarely in the frame and systemic broad cultural change is required. I've bent my brain trying to think about how we might do things differently. And the key to doing things differently and doing things well is listening to survivors, understanding their experiences and their needs. When the woman knows the perpetrator and he's part of her life in some way, shape or form, or she may not have forensic evidence to prove um, what happened. Um, and the idea of going through a court process to get justice is just all too much in what it entails for many people. There has to be other answers and other options. Another answer or another option that is restorative, that is empowering, that seeks justice and validation. My journey has led me very naturally to survivor-led restorative justice. So I started reaching out to this amazing community of restorative justice researchers, advocates and practitioners, and here I am today. And I commend Meredith and Miranda for pulling this all together so quickly and turning it into an online event so quickly. The large numbers of participants is testament to what an important conversation this is, and I'm so looking forward to the rest of the day. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that, um, for that welcome. Um, and it's really set us up, I think, for the discussion that's going to follow. I'm um, very happy now to introduce the next, the first panel, uh, which is going to be really setting the scene for what is the current um, pathway to restorative justice uh, in the ACT. Delighted that we've um, got Matisse Coyle, who's going to be joining us, who is um, a former participant of a restorative justice conference and a survivor. Professor John Braithwaite, an emeritus professor here at the Australian National University. Uh, Ms. Amanda Lutz, who is the previous uh, head of the ACT Restorative Justice Unit, and Mr. Richard Denning, who is the current head of the Restorative Justice Unit, and also Ms. Heather Page, who is a facilitator in the Restorative Justice Unit and who has got 
many, many years of experience uh, working as a facilitator. Uh, the panel, this panel and the other panels are going to be structured as a conversation. And I've got a, a few questions that I'm going to put to the different panel members. Uh, the first question is uh, for you, John, just wondering if you could briefly outline, you know, what is restorative justice and what is the history of restorative justice in the ACT? Well, restorative justice means restoring survivors, restoring uh, offenders and restoring communities. It's, it's, a, it's a, 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 about the idea that restorative justice can bring together all those who've been affected by some crime to, describe, to discuss who has been harmed, uh, what needs do they have, and what might be done to repair the harms and meet the needs. It's about, actually about a lot of ideas, but crucially about the idea that because crime hurts, Justice should heal and justice should be accountable to survivors of injustice. And the ACT was one of the first places in the world to recognise that possibility for a different kind of justice at first at the hands of uh, AC, then ACT Attorney General Terry Connolly. Uh, and there was experimentation with restorative justice in many types of crime. And ACT restorative justice became evidence-based. Uh, Nova uh, Inkpen, who was a senior justice official these days uh, in the ACT, a former head of the restorative justice unit, uh, in her PhD at ANU, she worked on evaluating restorative justice for drink driving offenders. Uh, that experiment was a failure, uh, not only in terms of its impact on offenders, but on, uh, on, on survivors. I, I won't go into why, but as a result of that research, I think the ACT has been the only place in the world that experimented with restorative justice for drink driving and the results, uh, including in Nova's research, is one reason why nowhere else in the world. Uh, early on, Terry Connolly decided that there would not be uh, from 1994, uh, that there would not be initially, certainly not initially, restorative justice for gendered violence cases. Uh, that thinking, including by Terry and others, began to change when, while experiments like that on drink driving failed, the highest impact experiment, uh, led by Sherman and Strang, was on violence cases. So the question be began to be asked in policy circles, well, if restorative justice is most effective in violence cases in the ACT, and that then that result was replicated uh, in, uh, in Britain uh, by our team, and these were effects of a 40% reduction in reoffending, which were much higher than with the property offences. If that's the case, that that's where they work more effectively. And then is it just uh, to deny the possibility of restorative justice in, uh, in uh, cases of gendered uh, violence? And so the thinking changed very much in the direction you outlined, Miranda, at the beginning and saying, look, uh, access to justice uh, in cases of sexual assault in the ACT is unsatisfactory in terms of access to the justice of the court, access to restorative justice, and access to the justice of support in the community. And we need to improve access to all kinds of justice. And so uh, my colleagues will move on to explain uh, the more recent history, um, uh, particularly Amanda, I guess, of how, uh, 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 how we moved step by step uh, to make restorative justice more, more available to these cases. And I might finish by saying the evidence has become stronger and more encouraging, including in uh, cases of gendered violence uh, in recent years. And if there's, uh, if there's time to discuss that most recent evidence, uh, I'll be pleased to do so. But I think we should move on instead. 
Thanks so much, John. Well, maybe I'll turn to Amanda now. Amanda, if you could um, take us through how the ACT got into what is now called stage phase three, where um, sexual assault and um, domestic violence are now covered um, under the um, Restorative Justice Unit and the legislation. Thanks, Miranda. Hi, everybody. Um, it's great to be here um, on Ngunnawal land, um, joining you all in this very important conversation. So I guess I, I've been um, lucky enough to be and privileged enough to be um, in the Justice and Community Safety Directorate at a very exciting time. Um, I started in the Restorative Justice Unit as a facilitator, as a convener in uh, 2010. And at that stage, it was only um, available for uh, people who were uh, impacted by the crimes of young people and, and technically less serious crimes. So serious offences, those which attract a maximum jail sentence of over 10 years were excluded. And also all domestic violence and sexual offences were excluded. So despite that, um, what I found as a convener, even working for um, many assault matters, many matters where there were high impacts, regardless of any label of what's serious or not serious, people impacted were getting a lot out of the um, restorative justice experience when it was carefully prepared, when their needs and interests were met. And we're talking about um, survivor initiated restorative justice. What we understand at the restorative, or what we did understand very clearly was the whole process has to be survivor led, has to be survivor focused. Can't just, it's not just about um, where the referral comes from or who has the idea initially, although it's obviously more powerful when that comes from the person impacted. Um, but we, yeah, we understood that um, it was really important to be, um, you know, addressing the needs, making sure that all the information provision was given, that there are off ramps that nobody felt compelled to be going along in a process um, to completion, uh, if at some particular point they felt it was no longer in their interest. So facilitators do a really good job of exploring what the needs and interests are, the safety risks, um, and making sure that the process is gonna be safe enough and satisfying, as well as upholding the interests and rights of all participants in the process. So that's really important. So um, when I became the uh, manager of the unit, in 2014, um, we, we coincided with another, this coincided with another sentencing inquiry. And we put a budget bid in because we knew we were going to need a lot more resource if we were hoping to move into making restorative justice available for um, people impacted by serious offences, including sexual assaults. So we had to embark on a, a campaign of awareness and information and sharing uh, research. We invited Rob Hulls, the former Attorney General in Victoria, to come and talk about innovative responses to sexual assault. Um, he was heading up the Centre for Innovative Justice at the RMIT at that stage. So we had about 80 people come to that. We kicked in with a lot more consultation uh, with, our, with our stakeholders. We had a lot of champions um, across the criminal justice system and, and also community agencies who were interested in progressing restorative justice for, um, for more survivors and, and victims and people impacted. Um, so gradually we were able to, I guess, continue the conversation formally and informally. Uh, we embarked on some very, you know, we, we were successful in getting a budget bid. And so we were moving into what we called phase two, working with adult um, offenders, as well as uh, working with serious offences. But we still recognised we needed to, to, to do a lot more training and have a lot more uh, understanding of sexual assault, uh, sexual offences generally, and how to be best responding, as well as for domestic violence. And we, we held off making those available um, till a later time so that we could more fully include people just to look at the, the particular issues around having restorative justice for those matters. Meanwhile, um, the new conveners were learning uh, um, about how to be managing conferences for serious offences and those involving adults. We brought Project Restore, the, the Project Restore team from New Zealand across to 
uh, to do some training with our key stakeholders. So we invited people from community um, agencies, from criminal justice agencies, from um, survivor support agencies. One of the very interesting things that came out of that, we had three um, people from DVCS, the Domestic Violence Crisis Service, come along and um, be part of that training. And through the use of conferencing role plays, they got to see what that might be, what that experience might be like for somebody impacted um, by a sexual assault. And so at that point, they got excited that actually there's a lot in this for people impacted, and maybe this is a service that can be supported and, and encouraged. So uh, we also brought um, a team out from Queensland Juvenile Justice um, and the Mater Family and Youth Service, who have been running uh, restorative justice processes for young people um, and sexual harms for over 15 years, very successfully. Um, working with families, working with professionals and, and young people to be addressing the impacts and addressing the responsibilities and addressing what needs to happen. So uh, we, you know, we benefited greatly from that kind of training. Uh, we had to develop guidelines um, for how we would manage sexual assault matters. We had to consider the, the vulnerabilities of um, different groups. We had to consult with, with um, LGBTIQ community. We had to consult with the disability sector. Uh, we had to consult with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. So we, we really needed to understand how the most vulnerable people in our community were going to be well supported through processes and what their needs might be. But of course, it all comes back to individuals. Uh, we can't assume we know what any one person wants out of a process and that's the beauty of restorative justice in that it pays attention, very close attention to what those needs and interests are and and um, and, and within, you know, the, um, the boundaries, I guess, there are criteria for um, people being found suitable to participate. So, you know, the classic textbook RJ is where the person responsible is taking fullest responsibility, is being active in making amends and wanting to uh, listen and understand the impact of, of the person who's been harmed. But then at the, um, you know, along the continuum, there's sometimes you have very strong survivors who really want an opportunity to have an encounter with the person who's harmed them. They have things that they want to say, that they want to express about their experience, about the impacts, about what they think should happen. And for them, sometimes it's not that important for them that the person is is conveying a textbook sense of responsibility. For them, sometimes it's that opportunity to get in the room and to, to be having a say. So it's, it's always managing and balancing the interests and needs and making sure that uh, the person harmed uh, would be going into a situation, either face-to-face -face or communication that's indirect, you know, by video or writing. Um, so that, that they know what they're getting into, that there, there aren't any big surprises on the day that will undermine and subvert the process. Um, that we understood, you know, that the coercion, as, as um, Marissa was saying, most people know the person who's harmed them. You know, the potential for coercion, the potential for um, power imbalance is huge. And so facilitators needed to have all of the training to give them that awareness of how to manage those matters, how to call it out in a conference, um, how to ensure that there are enough people supporting, both in an informal uh, community of care capacity and also bringing professionals so that we, we saw it as RJ+, plus, that we were adding a lot more support opportunities and that uh, there was a, a very strong focus on being really ready to um, counter any of those subversive elements that might come through the process. So finally, um, in two th November 2018, we moved into phase three. And, um, you know, I think overwhelmingly what we found, and the restorative justice unit's been very good at evaluating its own service um, and reporting back. It's obviously legislative, legislatively obligated to report to its referring entities and provide annual reports um, that, that speak to the satisfaction or dissatisfaction of people that go through the process. And even with the inclusion of sexual assaults and um, domestic violence in phase three, 
Um, the unit's been able to maintain a very high degree of satisfaction at around 97%. So the quality is there. Um, there's two conveners allocated to every um, sexual offence matter. So um, the focus in the, in the restorative justice area is always to maintain a quality service that is listening, that is paying attention to the individual needs uh, of its participants. And so I might read it there. <laughs> I think I've talked enough too. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. I might um, then turn to Richard and just ask him to, to pick up from, um, from where you've, you've given us the, a great background as to how we got to, um, to phase three. Richard, if you could just explain what are the different um, pathways that currently exist at the moment um, to restorative justice? Absolutely. So, um, and uh, thanks, Amanda. Thanks, John. I'm a relatively new addition to the restorative justice unit. So, I'm very happy to ride. Um, Amanda's coattails um, today and in general. <laughs> um, so since the commencement of phase three, the restorative justice unit uh, can accept referrals for sexual offences at any stage of the formal, formal criminal justice system, from police investigation all the way through to the completion of an order related to the sentence of the court. So these referrals can be received from criminal justice agencies and actors um, but victim survivors can also approach the restorative justice unit directly and we can facilitate a referral. Uh, in general, restorative justice processes follow in parallel to the criminal justice process here in the ACT. However, for less serious offending, police can make a diversion, uh, which if there's a conference which satisfies the victim survivor's needs and any outcomes are fully complied with, um, this may be the end of the formal criminal justice response. So um, obviously there are relatively few sexual offences which fit into this category of less serious. Um, however, diversions have occurred um, and in these cases and others involving gender-based violence um, in particular, we're careful not to treat offences in isolation um, and we can help shape an accountability process which incorporates broader patterns of behaviour which may or may not have been the subject of a charge. Um, additionally, we know that the harm suffered by victim survivors is rarely captured by the seriousness of any offence and is often compounded by previous instances of harm. Uh, so we're really, really um, mindful of that. Um, despite commencing in November 2018, we're still building awareness in the community about the availability of restorative justice for sexual offences and also building um, understanding and trust with our referral partners and also with the community sector. Um, so in 2019-20, we received um, five referrals for sexual offences and um, I believe the same number the year before. Um, as as Amanda has said, though, we, we've gotten more referrals, I would say, for... Um, family, family violence offences, um, but notwithstanding uh, moving into this more, uh, this space working with more serious offences, our satisfaction rate has maintained ex an extremely high level, as has our compliance with outcomes as well. Thanks very much, Richard. I, I might turn now to Heather, just to ask you, Heather, if you could outline um, how a restorative process usually runs, and in particular, how one would run um, in the context of a, a sexual assault matter. Thanks, Miranda. Uh, so once we receive a referral, conveners meet with the participants over a number of weeks um, before a conference to find out what the needs and the interests of the victim survivor are, and whether there's a likelihood that the offender will be able to respond in a way that will meet those needs. We refer to the perpetrator as the person responsible and the victim survivor as the person harmed. But today I'll use the terms perpetrator and victim survivor. Um, so during a conference, the perpetrator would speak first. This is to reassure the group that the perpetrator is taking responsibility because that's why everyone's there to hear that. The perpetrator is given an opportunity to talk about their actions, to reflect on what they did and why. Then the victim survivor is able to talk about the impacts on them and the people close to them. 
they might also have questions they want to ask. Supporters will be asked about what they've noticed and how they've been impacted. And then we talk about possible agreements and tasks the perpetrator could commit to in order to make things better. Thanks, Heather. Also, maybe could you explain what it is about a, um, a restorative process that has been uh, empowering for victim survivors? Sure. Um, so it's really important that victim survivors know they're able to set the boundaries around what's discussed and there's empowerment in that. Um, in telling the story of what happened, if, if telling the story of what happened will be very really traumatising for the victim, we won't do that. It isn't necessary to talk about sex acts, rather it's about the abuse of power. It might be empowering for the victim survivor to include others in the restorative circle, to be a witness to the perpetrator taking responsibility and to learn about the impacts on the victim survivor. Sexual offences may take place within an institutional setting, for example, and we would extend an invitation for representatives from that institution to attend if that's important to the victim survivor. Uh, we require perpetrators to engage with counselling or education and to prepare them to understand and to talk about what they've done because we're not counsellors or behaviour experts, behaviour change experts. When a perpetrator lives in the ACT, we've been able to refer them to every man and this has helped in the process. But then it's, it's ultimately up to the victim survivor to determine whether the perpetrator's response is adequate and possibly to request that they do more therapeutic work following the conference. Um, we encourage the inclusion of family, friends or close others in the restorative circle because sexual violence has impacts not only on the victim survivor, but also the people close to them. This is um, to help hold the perpetrator to account and to support the victim survivor before, during, and after the conference. Thanks um, so much, Heather. And uh, just a, a final question for you, who, um, in, on the basis of your, your experience, who benefits from, or who can benefit from restorative justice? So when someone has experienced sexual violence, it might seem counterintuitive to invite them to communicate with the person who harmed them. But for many victim survivors, they have questions which can only be answered by the perpetrator. It's appropriate for them to be angry and to want to express that anger towards the perpetrator during a conference. Victim survivors might ask for assurances about future safety to ensure that the perpetrator stays away from particular places, for example. They can request that the perpetrator commits to actions to repair the harm, such as reimbursing for costs associated with the offence, or a commitment to behaviour change. Most sexual offences take place within relationships and so the harm is also relational in the form of a profound breach of trust. So for some people, the repair also needs to be relational. But that doesn't mean it's about people hugging and making up. It's about addressing the relational harm and restoring right relations, whatever that looks like. Um, the sexual offences and the responses to the offences can also fracture relationships between the victim survivor and the people close to them. So a conference can provide a safe space to talk about that as well and to restore those relationships. Victim survivors can set the pace in preparing for a restorative process or they might choose to engage indirectly. Um, it's not the best option. Restorative justice won't be the best option for everyone who's experienced sexual violence. The victim survivors, the expert in their own experiences and, and their choices in recovery. And, and we, we realise that there's also strength and empowerment in choosing not to participate. Thanks so much, Heather. Uh, I'd like to now turn to uh, Matisse. And Matisse. Uh, could you tell us how did you first feel when you were offered restorative justice um, as an option? Uh, you know, how did you react and, and how did your personal um, support team react to that uh, possibility? Um, well, I had never heard of restorative justice before I was offered it. Um, 
so there was a bit of research in understanding like how it worked those sorts of things um i did struggle with knowing how i would feel in that situation because you can be given all the information on how it works what's going to go down but not knowing how i would feel seeing the perpetrator and having to deal with those emotions um, made it a difficult decision to make um, but I was really lucky I had an amazing personal support team um, and then also had a wonderful therapist professional support um, who was a really good sounding board for those concerns and the pros and cons because it essentially came down to that um, is this experience going to be helpful or more harmful to me and it yeah, I eventually decided that restorative justice was a really good option for me. Um, and it turned out it was. <laughs> can, you, can you tell us about why did you think it was going to be um, a good option for you? Um, I realised I had a lot to say. Um, and it was, this event had affected my life profoundly. Um, I had dropped out of uni. Um, I yeah, missed a semester of uni. I was like really struggling. Um, and so talking to my therapist, there didn't seem that many drawbacks. Um, like I wasn't in a good place. So anything that could possibly help that um, was sort of my best option. And also um, as Heather referred to before, um, I could also get reimbursed for uni and therapy's not, uh, not cheap. Um, so those sorts of things also made it, yeah, quite, a, quite an easy decision in the end, but it did take a bit of thought. And, and what was the process like for you that, that you went through, just in general terms? Um, in like a word, I would say supportive. Um, because I was helped through absolutely everything and I was given options at every point. Um, it was all catered to me. And when the options didn't fit, a personal option was made. Um, little things like um, being neurodiverse. So catering towards that in my face-to-face -face meeting, um, I was allowed to have like a desk so I could do writing um, to help me focus little things like that um the conveners going out of their way to make everything a positive experience for me um so i we had a lot of um it was during COVID times it happened earlier this year um so lots of zoom meetings beforehand um and then culminating in like a three-hour face-to-face meeting um which it was probably quite long, but we had lots of breaks and I could leave that room feeling like I had said everything I needed to say. And what were some of the, the hardest things for you and, and some of the best things from this process? Um, I definitely touched on it before, the not knowing um, how I was gonna feel in that situation. I don't think anybody can prepare you. Um, but I've worked with Heather to um, write some of my personal accounts to go on the RJ website so that somebody in my situation can read an experience because I didn't have that option. Um, I was given the rundown on how everything worked, but actually knowing those things, I don't think you can ever know, but somebody having like a better idea of how it affected me, um, I thought could be positive because I did find that difficult. Um, and the positives were numerous. <laughs> um, but I think the big one was being able to look the perpetrator in the eyes and tell them about all the harm they'd done. And leaving that room, it might sound cliche, but I definitely felt a weight lifted off. Um, and I don't really know how else to put that without sounding cliche um, because I felt less tied to that event. Um, 
that I could breathe a bit easier and that it wasn't holding me down. Um, and definitely after the event, the like reoccurring thoughts and those sorts of things were a lot easier to deal with. So re reflecting and, you know, thank you for being so amazingly articulate about, <laughs> about all of these experiences. Um, so just reflecting on what you've gone through now, you've said that you've, you're going to put some of your experiences on the website so that others can hear about it. But yep. what sort of, um, what do you, would you have to say about, uh, you know, w would you recommend this to uh, other survivors of, of sexual assault or what would you have to say if somebody came to you asking for um, your advice? Um, I would wholeheartedly recommend everyone to consider it. I understand that it's not going to be for everyone, um, but there are so many options within restorative justice. You don't ever have to feel forced to face somebody face to face. There are lots of other indirect options. And I think my experiences, the comparison between my experience with the police and my experience with RJ were night and day. Um, with RJ, everything was led by me and catered to me, um, which as somebody who is queer and neurodiverse, um, the police environment was difficult for me to deal with. Um, and I did have a professional support person when I was dealing with the police, but um, it wasn't quite the same approach. And I think that um, the restorative justice approach really suited me. And when I was in that state of mind and I had gone through that experience, um, I needed somebody to listen and to be in control and to feel in control in that situation. And when I was dealing with the police, I didn't feel that. Um, but when I was with restorative justice, I completely felt in control in um, my conference. I was confident and easily able to call out my perpetrator when things didn't line up or they weren't taking responsibility for their actions. Um, the conveners also did that, but I felt confident to do it um, before they even got the chance. Um, so yeah, I couldn't recommend it strongly enough. And that's why I'm here because um, before I was in that situation, I didn't know that this was an option. And I think it should be more widely known because it is such an excellent option. Thanks so much, Matisse. Um, thank you for having me. Oh no, thank you. And thank you for, to all of the panelists. We've got um, five minutes now for, or five to 10 minutes for questions. Uh, so I'm going to hand over uh, to Helen, who's been um, taking the who's taking the questions. Uh, so Helen, if you could read out the questions for us now. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start with the first one. So this is from Haley Boxall at the Australian Institute of Criminology. So the appropriateness of gender-based violence for inclusion in RJ has been debated for years. I'm just wondering if you've had any pushback against stage three during the initial conversations about the expansion and afterwards? And how have you managed any pushbacks? So I'm gonna direct that question to Amanda. Uh... Sorry, just unmuting. Um, yeah, yeah, of course the, there's been pushback. And so it was, it's been a very lively debate and discussion. And I think a lot of the pushback comes from people who envisage the top end worst case scenario of putting uh, a survivor in the room with a, a perpetrator without preparation or without the the safety frameworks and the and the um, you know the trained facilitation. So, um, and I think that often and people perhaps who work in the crisis point um, are very much concerned with other things rather than bringing um, you know. Uh, up a service that, that anticipates an encounter between the two. And I guess criminal justice agencies also, uh, early on especially, have feel an obligation to be minimising any contact between um, 
people harmed and, and those responsible. So yeah, we definitely did. I think what was heartening was that we had a lot of support from human rights area that saw the absolute um, need to be upholding the interests um, of victims of crime and empowering them as well as acknowledging the need for protection. Protection is important, but we can overdo that and start to oppress people and, and limit their, their options. So I think just continuing the conversation and it's so heartening to hear Matisse speak today to see um, that all the, all the work that went into it um, has led to people, you know, being able to access the service and genuinely benefit from it. So very heartening. Thanks, Matisse. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, Helen, an, another question? Or unless did, did Richard or um, Heather, do you have anything you wanted to add to that? Okay. Uh, yeah, Helen, another question? Okay, so the next one's um, for Richard Denning, and this is from Rhiannon McGlynn, who's the Supreme Court Associate. Does restorative justice referral during the police investigation prejudice the outcome of the criminal matter? And is it typically that the referral is made and the RJ process does not commence until the completion of the matter? So um, in terms of those referrals at the police stage, um, those will the risk of kind of, uh, I guess, polluting the evidence in the criminal matter. Um, and so uh, from, from talking with police, I understand that this is something that they are very aware of um, and that they talk to victim survivors about um, at the stage of, of that referral. Um, the, the issue can be around um, the communication between, and I have to be, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I, can't, I can't give a really definitive account on this, it's about the communication between um, the victim survivor and the perpetrator in the conference. Um, it may be that that may um, prejudice the evidence in a later trial. So for that reason, um, if the victim survivor is interested in pursuing a formal criminal justice outcome, um, you would normally wait until later in the criminal justice process where those possibilities um, don't come up to um, progress the restorative justice matter, um, as I think Rhiannon was hinting at. Um, did, did anyone have anything else to add to that? I think often there is a lot of concern about this idea of if a victim survivor chooses to access a restorative justice process um, before a criminal justice outcome, that um, they're cutting off their options in some way. Um, I think that's kind of like any decision that any of us have to make. Um, we reach juncture points where we kind of have to choose one direction or another. And as long as a victim survivor understands what the potential consequences of their choice are, um, my view would be that we need to support them to go on the path that best meets their needs. Thanks, Richard. I think that these are some of the issues that are also going to be addressed in the last panel too. Uh, so, uh, Helen, another question, and we, actually we've probably got time for two more, so maybe could you, could you read out two questions and then we'll um, ask the panellists to answer. Okay, no problem. Uh, so, the third question um, is, is from an anonymous um, attendee. Can you ask for restorative justice if the perpetrator has not taken responsibility? At what point or points is it effective to ask for RJ? And then maybe I'll turn to Heather to answer that question. Uh, so the, the first thing that we're assessing um, when we meet with the perpetrator is whether they are taking responsibility because we, we understand that it's going to be more harmful for the victim survivor if, if the person responsible is making excuses, if they're minimising, if they're not taking full responsibility, we, we'd have to consider whether it's actually suitable for restorative justice. We do do quite a lot of work with uh, perpetrators to prepare them and sometimes there is some level of perhaps minimisation. So that's where the preparation work comes in. And in these sort of cases, we would um, seek to refer them to um, support agencies who might be able to help them to do that. But um, if they're not taking responsibility, 
I think we would consider that it's not suitable for restorative justice. So. Thanks, Heather. Uh, another question? Okay, final question. Uh, this is from Janet Hope. What, do you, what does the panel think are the key factors that inhibit referrals from within the criminal justice system? And what would it take to work restoratively with those in the system who could refer matters but choose not to for reasons other than survivor preference? Thank you. I'll, I'll leave that up. I'm not sure if Amanda or Richard wants to, um, to, to jump on that one. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, that's a complex question, absolutely. Um, and and if, we, um, if we knew the answer to that 100%, um, we'd be completely overwhelmed with referrals, I'm sure. Um, I think a big issue is about awareness. Even though Canberra is a small place, um, there's... there's there's still, I think, a lack of awareness in the community, but also in the justice sector about the availability of restorative justice and then also about when and how it can be accessed. So I think that is probably um, the biggest barrier. Um, and that's why um, things like this symposium are such a great opportunity to kind of demystify um, and having someone like Matisse talk about her experience, I think that um, speaks much louder than... Thank you so much, Matisse. Thanks. Um, thanks, Richard. Well, we're going to... Oh, John, did you have something you wanted to add there? I was going to say that the, the, the last question, I think, goes to one of the issues, and that is acceptance of responsibility. The ACT Restorative Justice Act has a, a particular, you know, well-developed, and I think one that works well, as Heather's comments show, approach to responsibility. Uh, and it's, it's not admitting to criminal responsibility, but it is taking responsibility for the offence. But, but there's a sense of trickiness uh, that, uh, in that. And I think there's been great wisdom, not only in sexual offences, but across all kinds of uh, offences in that difficult issue that causes a kind of reluctance in the system. Well, this person is admitting to responsibility, uh, but they don't want to make formal criminal admissions as they are required to do in some other uh, uh, jurisdiction. So uh, I, I think people in the system are concerned that they're not seen as setting a trap for the offender and putting them into a kind of a, a double jeopardy. Thanks very much, John. Um, and thank you really to all of the panelists, especially to um, Matisse, you really, really appreciate those, um, the, the, that personal journey that you shared with us. Uh, so thank you, everybody. We're gonna have a five minute break now um, and then come back for the next panel. Uh, so I'll just ask all of the, um, the panelists uh, for this panel to turn off your video and your, um, your mics and then the ones for the next panel to turn theirs on in five minutes. Thank you, everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, can I invite um, Paula and Sue and Eve and Nina to switch their cameras on? Okay, great. Well, um, we might kick off the second session. So uh, welcome everybody. Um, so this second panel is about understanding the needs of survivors of sexual assault and harassment. Um, and before I started, I also wanted to acknowledge that I'm on Ngunnawal country, 
and acknowledge their elders past and present and acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are on the panels and who are listening at home as well. I'd also like to acknowledge the toll that sexual violence has taken on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and communities, including um, sexual violence as a feature of colonisation, along with the dismantling of long existing sexual violence prevention and response mechanisms. I'd also like to acknowledge that the experiences of Indigenous survivors have often not been reflected in the anti-sexual violence movement, <clears throat> as well as the way that these experiences have at times been manipulated to justify greater disruption and intrusion in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's lives. Um, and I just wanted to um, open it up to the panel if they wanted to offer any acknowledgement for, in their particular location as well. Yes, I'm happy to. Yes, yeah. and I'm coming from Dark and Jing country. So, yeah, so I'm, um, I'm Camilla Roy Bigambool and on Ngunnawal Nambri lands. I too am on Ngunnawal and Nambri land. I too am on beautiful Ngunnawal country. Um, I would also um, like to take a moment. Um, we had two uh, representatives from community who were originally approached to be engaged in this panel. Um, and Tracy and Rochelle from Sisters in Spirit Aboriginal Corporation have asked I provide this dialogue which they have pre prepared um, and I'm incredibly privileged to do so. Um, as women in the community and directors of Sisters in Spirit Aboriginal Corporation, Tracy and Rochelle, who are invited to speak on this panel, have called for a future panel dedicated to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. As they are committed to the importance of upholding Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women's cultural obligation for representation of the many views that can currently exist regarding the specialised and cultural competency in services to begin to address the right to have a justice related outcome of sexual assault victims. And in their voice, especially given the historic background for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families in this country and still today. Let's be clear that we are saying it is an honour in our respective communities to carry important messages and to participate in these events. But we do not do this without initial discussions with our experts, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women in this community here and seek direction from the eldership that exists in our community today and time immemorial. So we have asked that in lieu of us not presenting that a future panel of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women speak to this very important subject and that this message is seen as paramount to the ongoing support needed for our First Nations peoples to continue to be front and centre to maximise the longevity of the expertise that has been most researched people in the world to place us on the map towards a conciliatory example of what respect, resilience and recognition is. They have sent their well wishes to the panel and they certainly look forward to engaging with the Restorative Justice Unit alongside the Sisters in Spirit Aboriginal Corporation Board of Directors. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Um, I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, so uh, Sue, Sue Weber, who you've just heard from, is the Chief Executive Officer of the Domestic Violence Crisis Service and has over 15 years experience in the non-government sector, including in the areas of sexual, domestic and family violence, including with ANU's Respectful Relationships Unit, um, Meridian, Agenda Agenda and Canberra Rape Crisis Centre. Uh, Sue's preferred pronouns are she, her. Um, Paula McGrady is a Camilla... Paula has lived in ACT for close to 17 years um, in Canberra and she calls this place her home and community away from where her, she originally comes from. When Paula first moved to Canberra, she worked at, for Doris Women and Children's Refuge, including several other youth um, refuges within the ACT as a second job. Paula worked full-time and currently as a casual worker with the Canberra Rape Crisis Centre. Um, Paula also worked with the, uh, as the Family Engagement Officer at, at Binberry um, Youth Detention Centre 
Um, for over five years, Paula currently works for Community Services Directorate in Child Protection, but continues to work casually with the Camper Rape Crisis Centre. Paula loves to immerse herself in community and believes in staying connected to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community where she chooses to live, as it keeps her real um, to her identity and upbringing and the responsibility to her community she values. Um, she is grounded always by her peers and the people she works with. They're the ones that support the most disadvantaged or in need across the ACT. And this is where Paula thrives best. Nina Fennell is a Walkley award-winning journalist, author, and sexual assault survivor advocate. She's a director of End, End Rape on Campus Australia and was lead author of the Red Zone Report. Nina is the creator and manager of the Let Her Speak campaign for which she has been awarded three Walkley Awards and a Kennedy Award. She's currently writing a book titled Let Her Speak due out in 2022 through HarperCollins. Eve Walker is the president of the ANU Postgraduate and Research Students Association. She's in her final year of studying a Juris Doctor at the ANU and was a recipient of the New Colombo Scholarship in 2018. Her main areas of interest include law reform and student-led social activism. Eve's preferred pronouns are she, her. And um, gosh, we're so lucky to have all of you here. <laughs> I think it's just amazing. Um, but I'll dive into the questions and uh, um, I'll, I'll throw this question to you initially, Sue, but then um, I'll, I'll open it up to others. But what are some of the most common needs of survivors of sexual violence? Thank you, Richard. Um, and it is a pleasure to be here with all of the panellists today. Um, the needs of survivors are diverse but the commonality is actually that they need to be heard, believed and responded to in ways that promote care and well-being, and also lead them to an array of options around perpetrator accountability if that is something that they wish to pursue. Survivors need community, social and service support in the response to sexual violence. And that looks different for every single survivor that I have ever worked with. Um, and it is compounded by uh, the issues around our response system, having so few options in regards to perpetrator accountability. We seem to be slightly better in terms of care and response. However, we're not consistent. So different survivors have different levels of care and support responses, which creates this vast inequality of the actual um, experience uh, for survivors. But our avenues for perpetrator um, accountability are incredibly narrow, which means that um, often people are left without the resolution to the circumstance that they've experienced. And I say circumstance because um, the act of sexual violence exists within a series of other constructs um, often for people. And those constructs can exist in the lead up to um, the perpetration, during the perp perpetration, or even after. And we can see that in examples where communities around people want them to pursue particular criminal avenues that they don't feel comfortable or supported to do. Um, or we can see that um, the social environment leading up to uh, um, the sexual assault may have um, seen some community um, collusion or support for um, the engagement between two people or the pursuit of one person after another um, at all costs. So um, that's why I, I, I use that terminology because the actual um, offence is one part of what um, people need a response to. Paula, I might throw to you next. Is there anything you would add about the common needs of survivors of sexual violence? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, and first and foremost, in line with what Sue said and what I'm sure many others will say as well, is um, to be believed. I think that's really, really important. And, and, and to feel that their story is safe and that they feel safe. Um, you know, to feel safe that, um, that they can trust us when they tell us their story. Um, I think, you know, to, to have respect for their story 
and always show that respect. You know, make them, um, you know, make survivors, victims, you know, feel like that their story is the most safest with you. I think that's really, really important. And, and that just comes out of my experience working, you know, with um, survivors of, of sexual abuse at Canberra Rape Crisis Centre. Um, and I also think um, consistency with uh, support workers, with, um, with uh, you know, the counsellors, uh, police. I think um, the less time a survivor has to tell their story, um, you know, obviously the, the better that will be for their, you know, mental wellbeing. But they're, you know, they're some of the basic things I think, and I don't mean that disrespectfully by saying basic, but they're some of the needs that are, the, that are so important um, to that survivor, to that person telling that story, to that person calling up for the first time, you know, whether it's through one of our mediums in um, via a crisis line to say what's happened to them, whether it's just happened, whether it's happened 20 years ago, whether it's happened 60 years ago, mm. and we get those stories. But um, I think those fundamentals are very, very important. Nina, what, what would you add to that list? Oh, um, well, firstly, thank you um, for having me. Um, and I completely agree that survivors, first and foremost, need to be believed um, that, you know, the nature of the crime itself is that it takes power and control away from somebody. So we know what is fundamentally um, healing, I guess, um, as a very first step is ensuring safety of the person, both external and internal, but also restoring power and control and agency to the person, whatever that looks like for that person in that moment. And I think something that Sue has um, touched on before is that every single survivor is different and also what survivors' needs are across time will evolve and change as well. So what might be right for a survivor today in terms of what's going to ensure safety and a sense of um, control and agency may actually be quite different tomorrow or in five years or in 10 years. Um, I, I, I'm happy to talk more about the specific needs um, of survivors within university contexts and how they, um, I, you know, I think all survivors have that common um, need for safety and control, but then there are some other specific needs which might be um, unique to university context that we can talk about too. Well, we'll come to that in a little bit, but before um, we move on, Eve, was there anything um, you'd like to add about the needs of, uh, or the common needs of, of survivors? Um, I think this has been a really comprehensive list. Uh, being believed, being respected, not having people question why you're in a situation or any of the other um, elements involved. But the final thing I think involved in empowerment is knowing what your options are moving forward, um, because that way you're actually able to make an informed decision and choose what's right for you, whatever that might be. Wonderful, thanks Eve. Um, the next question I have is for you, Paula. And I was wondering if I could invite you to talk about your experience working in the Nuru program at Canberra Rape Crisis Centre. Yep, sure. Look, firstly, I love what I do. I love who I work with. Um, and, you know, that, that's testament to being working in this tough space for, you know, for 10 plus years. Um, it's, um, it's a very, very rewarding job. And I understand, you know, not a lot of people can, can you know, do this type of work. Um, but yeah, when you work with a great team, it makes it very, very easy. Um, and when you know that that team work from the heart, that also makes it very easy. So um, Paula, can you tell everyone about the Nuru program? That, that yeah, might be helpful yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I was still going. Um, so the Nuru program, um, I was a part of, uh, and that's uh, a, an Indigenous section of Canberra Rape Crisis. Um, you know, we have SAMHSA, which is a male section of the service that provides support to male survivors. But, but the Naguru program specifically is to support um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander survivors. Um, and I was coordinator of that program. So I covered a lot of areas um, 
in that space as a crisis worker um, where I would tend to phone calls. Um, I, you know, covered um, on calls, which was week working after hours, working on weekends, and that meant that you get, got called out to um, uh, either FAMSAC or SACAT to um, either an evidence in chief or to a forensic medical examination. Um, so I, 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 as well as su supporting um, in-house the counselling service um, and support for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander survivors, I also did a myriad of other things as well. Um, and sometimes I did have, um, you know, non-Indigenous people that, um, that for some reason made a connection with me. And, um, you know, I may have met them when I've gone out on a call out and, and you know, that connection, um, you know, was really important to keep. So, um, you know, I, I also did that kind of support as well. Um, you know, I've got a couple of stories that, you know, I can, I can reflect on that really remind me of where I'm working and why I'm working in this space. You know, and that's where I had a phone call from an Indigenous man well into his 60s who um, is a, was a survivor of, of child sexual assault. And I was the first person that he ever disclosed this abuse to. I mean, that alone is, is I, I feel so respected um, and valued from that person to be able to trust me enough to tell me that most important story of theirs, to not even tell their wife um, uh, or anyone and to carry this story for, you know, for that amount of years, you know, 50 plus years. You know, I had another phone call where uh, a lady called and the first thing that she said to me is, you need to tell me to turn my car off. And that was the first line that I will never, ever forget. And I'm like, okay, um, can you please turn your car off? And later on, you know, throughout my conversations with her, you know, she was somebody who was ready to do something really harmful. Um, these are the stories that keep me in this space. Um, you know, and these are the important stories. Um, and, I, and I throw much respect around the word stories. Um, because it's their story, you know, and we're there to help support them. And, and, and look, and being a part of that service, I think, um, is a great service, but I think we need to expand on that service. I think there needs a lot of support thrown into that space, um, you know, to encourage um, more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workers in that um, area of, 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 you know, sexual violence, because we certainly do need more counsellors. Um, we do need more support, um, you know, our statistics absolutely reflect that. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit about what I've done, um, you know, even as far as supporting somebody who, um, you know, was a person, a male person in AMC that also was abused as a child and then to carry all of the blame for a myriad of reasons um, that they are at fault. And then when you do say to them, well, look, um, and it's something very common that I do say when I go out to um, all of my call outs, you know, I say there is nothing that you can convince me in saying that any of this was your fault. And I'm so adamant and so clear about that. And you can just see a big weight is lifted from the survivors when you do take that, that um, you know, when you allow them, well, not you allow them, but when, you know, they, they're they free to, to, um, to lay 100% responsibility to blame on that perpetrator. Um, so that's kind of a, that's a, a little bit of what I do and what I have done. Um, and I continue to do. Um, as a casual. And Paul, in your experience, um, what, are, what are some of the needs of survivors that may be unique or different for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Um, privacy. Uh, you know, the fear, shame, the self-blame you know, the being labelled, being ostracised, you know, the, the 
the retribution from family, from community, from, from the perpetrator. And all this is wound up in the way we live in our community. So, um, you know, th those, um, those things are so important because we generally all know each other in community. And privacy is very, very important. Um, and even though they, you know, they're, they're things, they're things that are, are, are really highlighted um, because of our close-knit community and how we live. Um, you know, I'd like to see, um, you know, sex offender programs be a little bit more out there in community um, to, and I think, you know, I think this approach needs to be a, a, a community approach. You know, I think we all need to be on the same page and give the same message. Um, I'm very, very big on, on, on visualising and being visual in seeing things. Um, you know, one of the things that I was happy to be involved in was um, one of our ACT buses, you know, has um, the back of the bus, has the Naguru program, has, um, you know, an advertisement of what Canberra Rape Crisis is, you know, um, SAMHSA, all of the services in that program. So, um, you know, it's just about being out there and, and being real and telling the story for what it is. Um, I'd like to see a story that's, um, that, you know, that is real, that can be confronting for society, that can be confronting for community. Um, but if that, if that confrontation, confrontation for society you know, offends us and upsets us, you know, this amount, imagine how it feels for a survivor. So let's not make an ad like the milkshake ad. Let's make an ad and make it real. Um, yeah, I don't think we have time to fluff over this, um, this subject. You know, people ask me, where do you work? You know, or what are you doing this weekend? And I say, well, I'm working at Canberra Rape Crisis Centre. And you forget the word rape is a very confronting word for people. So you only have to look at their face to like, oh, okay. Um, and they leave it as that. So we need to get the message out there. Um, we need to tell the truth about what this form of violence does to our community, you know, to our young people, you know, to our mothers, you know, to our sisters, you know, to our men. Um, yeah. Thanks, Paula. Um, the next question, I'll, I'll direct it at you first, Nina. Um, are there unique or different needs for survivors on university campuses? Yeah, um, so, and thank you, Paula. And I guess, you know, as I said before, all survivors have certain needs around safety and to be believed that it's not their fault, that they're not alone, and to have control and agency restored. Beyond that, though, within university spaces, I think, um, you know, the work that I've done through End Rape on campus, if I, I might um, illustrate by way of example, um, a typical sort of story that we might see um, might be a survivor who has been living, say, in a college residence, who has experienced sexual assault in their dorm room. Um, often the offender will be, um, and reflecting the fact that sexual assault is a gendered crime that typically impacts um, on women, um, it might, the offender might be a fellow male college student. And after that assault, um, we might see a range of things. So firstly, those kind of common trauma impacts around shame, denial, self-blame, um, recriminations, nightmares, flashbacks, intrusive thoughts, etc. Beyond that, though, um, it would be fairly typical to see that that person may begin to um, to avoid certain spaces. They might disengage from some of their subjects. They might, um, let's say they then get to a point where they can't sleep in the same room that, where the assault has happened. So they might then need to exit their accommodation. They might then need to apply for a loan, a short-term bursary loan from the university in order to pay bond for a share house. Um, so already you can begin to see that now they've got some financial needs, they've got housing and accommodation needs, they've got um, academic needs, they might need extensions on assignments. And very often when that happens, 
um, they will have to tell their story to multiple different people within a university in order to apply for different extensions in different subjects. Um, from that point, we might just begin to see that they, you know, agoraphobia, fear of open spaces, fear of crowds, and then there are the social repercussions. So the fallout within their own social community. So um, peers taking sides, um, peers demanding that the survivor um, be accountable, you know, it, it, to them, um, often they want explanations. Um, that can then provoke yet more trauma responses, which in turn can provoke yet more um, educational disengagement and round and round it goes. And so by the time we're um, meeting a person, they might be um, really disengaged from their education. They might be experiencing a range of trauma impacts. Um, they might not understand how those things are all connected, um, except that they know that their life has suddenly, in their words, maybe fallen apart. Um, and they might be experiencing a lot of um, people within their own social community isolating, uh, sorry, ostracizing them, blaming them. Um, and then when you have a, and I guess, you know, we're here to talk about restorative justice. And I think that I'm cautiously optimistic in the sense that anything that provides more options to survivors is a good thing um, because we know that different survivors um, will want to avail themselves of different options. My caution comes around the fact that often within university settings there is already so much social pressure on the survivor to you know why are you trying to ruin his life why can't you just get over this why have you got to make a big deal out of this and in that context i can see that um, if you have a survivor who did want to pursue criminal justice as an option they could be pressured into a restorative justice option and i'm not suggesting that those two things are always or have to be mutually exclusive but i can certainly see how that could play out um, i guess my other um, concern is even if that pressure is not direct from peers themselves there is a kind of broader social um, environment and gendered environment and landscape in Australia that I think we have to acknowledge, where women's anger is very often codified as irrational. Um, women are often expected to, um, uh, I guess, uh, shrink their own pain to make space for um, the rehabilitation and growth of men. Um, and I've seen this in a, in a range of different um, areas that I've been involved in. And I guess my concern is that if we have an option that sort of says to women, um, you know, and I can certainly see how it could be very beneficial for a lot of people, I'm not denying that, but I just think we need to acknowledge that um, the, the if that women are already often socialised to try to be conciliatory in their approaches. Um, and if we're not critical of that and how that could um, influence the ways in which women are within university contexts sort of steered off um, into accepting restorative justice as a preferred option for them and their peers. I, I'm, yeah, I, I don't know if that's making sense. I should also say I've got a five month old baby. I'm very tired, um, but I hope that there's a kernel in there that, you, that can make sense and that you can understand. Nina, perhaps unsurprisingly, as a journalist, you're communicating very clearly. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, Eve, what, what would you add to what Nina's said? Um, I think my answer would depend on whether or not we're talking about international or domestic students, um, because their needs vary greatly. In the case of international students, quite frequently, they're not only um, ostracized or like separated from their parents and family who are back home, an issue that's um, amplified by COVID, but also they're very mindful of how their behavior will be um, reflected on in their own cultural groups. Um, nowadays, a lot of us are really mindful of the fact that social media exists and whatever is posted online is permanent and your reputation is really hard to get away from no matter where you travel to. Um, so people are much less likely to reach out to quite commonly Western forms of support because they seem foreign to them, but also uh, they won't necessarily provide any useful long-term assistance that they can perceive. Whether or not that's true or not is a different question. Um, and then I guess for students who are domestic, it's a question of whether or not they're postgraduate students who tend to have a lot of historic cases or undergraduate students. Because postgraduate students, from what I've seen, tend to live off campus more frequently. They're more um, 
aware of their options when it comes to resources, they're more likely to reach out external to university. Um, and I guess they just have more life experience. When it comes to undergraduate students, um, especially the ones who live in residential uh, halls, I'd have to agree with Nina in that there is a lot of social pressure. I've heard statements from students uh, who've been asked by other SRs to not file formal complaints because they'll ruin the culture on campus or in their halls. Um, and they also, uh, I guess, are a bit concerned about the optics of reaching out to resources at the university because it, this may not be true, but a lot of them see there, it as there being an inherent conflict of interest where they think that the university's main priority is to protect the interests of the university rather than the interests of the students. Um, that's partially just, it's a, it's a widespread issue, um, which is common also to international students um, in relation to how their data is being used. But um, product of uh, universities in Australia, their response to the 2017 report into sexual harassment and violence on campus. Um, so that would probably be the primary differences. Otherwise, it's the same for um, other survivor groups, but it's probably more focused on um, how this will impact your career. Um, uh, because a lot of students haven't also entered into the graduate field and life can feel very insular when all you know is your tertiary studies. So I'll, th I'll throw the next question to you um, initially. Um, what ex so we've heard a bit about what some of the needs are um, and we've also started to hear about what some of the gaps are or ways that needs aren't being met. Um, in your view, are, are, are needs being met and, and if not, what's missing? Oh yeah, totally not. <laughs> um, I think that we we are missing many needs of many um, individual survivors, but we're also um, missing the opportunity to reflect and engage in a critical analysis of what it actually exists to respond to survivors in particularly um, you know particular population groups or communities. I think. You know, I, I think the university sector is a really interesting um, sort of example of that and all of the issues that Nina and Eve have just illustrated there. Um, but we also are not talking about, um, I guess, the inadequacy of responses that service systems have uh, to individuals have, who have experienced sexual violence and where restorative approaches can be useful um, in, in responding to that if institutions are able to reflect upon themselves to discharge their power within a restorative process um, and, and enter into those in, in good faith. And there was, you know, as controversial as this may sound, there was some particular individual examples within um, the defence forces where restorative um, approaches between the defence force and an individual serving member um, actually had really healing benefits for, for an individual um, in regards to the way that that institution responded to um, mm. instances of sexual violence within that community. So I think there's a, there's a broader and significantly longer panel discussion about um, the utility of restorative practices in those formats as well. Um, but we, we still aren't as a sector and as a society um, competent enough to actually centre uh, the voices of lived experience in our service sector design and decision making around how we are going to look at funding, uh, sorry, how we are going to look at responding, let alone funding a service sector response to the issues of sexual violence um, or family domestic intimate partner violence, um, however, however that comes about. But, you know, we still are working with these kind of archaic funding models to fund services that deliver particular outcomes to the funding bodies and kind of told to centre the experiences of, of um, survivors and, and victims within that, but it doesn't all link yet. We're just not there. Um, and then we're still not even talking about the intersectional nature of experiences for individuals as well. So the individual of a, um, of a survivor who is uh, uh, female, white, middle class is different to the experience of a survivor who is white, middle class, 
but a member of the LGBTIQA plus community, um, or an international student or culturally and linguistically diverse, a person with a disability, we still are not sophisticated enough to actually be um, looking and responding to the needs consistently well. Occasionally we have a good one, but consistently well um, to individuals uh, within those population groups as well. I'll, th I'll throw open that question about whether um, needs, needs are being met now and what, and if not, what's missing to the rest of the panel, whoever would like to, um, to speak to that. Um, I might just have a comment there. I think I'd agree with Sue in saying there's a lack of consistency. Um, there's also a lack of overall funding and service availability, um, realistically speaking, especially in Canberra, just because we have a very small population. Um, I think in order to have a more, it's gonna take time. Um, we currently have in our disciplinary policy at the ANU uh, reference to restorative justice as being one of the three options available to students. But the feedback I've gotten is that a lot of people aren't um, properly trained in that. It's not actually offered to the majority of complainants. Um, and I don't know how uh, the university sector would focus on recruiting more uh, culturally and linguistically diverse candidates who appropriately reflect the population at the necessary rate that they need to. They need to um, abide by some of the recommendations that they agreed to in 2018. But besides that, uh, it's gonna be, it's gonna take time. I might um, jump in and add, um, firstly, no, I don't, the, the simple answer is no, I don't think that universities are adequately responding to the needs of the survivor population. Um, I, I see this um, also from the perspective of a journalist who um, goes to universities for right of reply frequently um, when survivors have contacted me wanting to tell their story to the media. And, um, and what I see as an institution responding to me, so as an institutional response, is a whole bunch of minimisation, deflection, um, shifting blame, um, denials, <laughs> in other words, the exact sort of um, responses that we also see from perpetrators. So when I see institutions behaving in that manner, it doesn't give me a huge amount of confidence as to how they're actually responding to individual survivors um, in closed rooms beyond the scrutiny of others. And then that, that concern, I guess, has been um, cemented by some of the stories that I hear from survivors, because I think one of the things that I really want to um, highlight is that even if you have a very well-intentioned, well-funded, well-resourced um, university response to this issue, you still often have a survivor who is required to make multiple disclosures to multiple people over and over again. You have policies which are difficult to locate, policies which are written in a language which is very hard to decipher, even for law students, I might add, and I've seen that frequently. You have policies that don't marry up between university institutions and the colleges on those same institutions. You have a survivor in the middle of all of that who is impacted by trauma and who is somehow expected to navigate all of that. Um, and what t tends to happen is that even if everybody within that ecosystem believes the survivor wants to help them, it's all very well intentioned, the system itself aggravates trauma. Um, and, and that's when we see things like um, disengagement, etc. cetera. Um, and, and what I find really problematic about, about that, and I, I had one survivor describe it to me as a callous bureaucracy. And I think that that's a pretty apt description of, of what the, the from the survivor's perspective of how the institutional um, uh, elements play out. Um, I, and I just wanna kind of be a little bit controversial here and just throw an idea out there, um, cause I think that's the role of journalists, is that one of the questions that I have is, yes, I think restorative justice can be immensely beneficial for some people, some of the time in some contexts. But I'm also very critical about, or very um, suspicious of institutions viewing this as a solution of convenience for them, because it gets them off the hook from having to provide a much wider suite um, of support and have it and so that a survivor can relax back into an ecosystem where every part of that ecosystem is there to support that survivor. 
And in theory, if um, universities are comfortable, uh, are, are wanting what is best for the survivor, then they should be just as comfortable with a survivor pursuing um, restorative justice as they would be a survivor pursuing telling their story in the media. Because for some survivors, that is actually the thing that may be restorative or healing for them. And I can tell you, I'm yet to see a university out there that is comfortable with a survivor telling their story in the media. And that to me speaks volumes about whether or not universities really want what is best for the survivor, however the survivor defines that, or whether they um, want what is potentially good for a survivor, but also mutually convenient and beneficial for them because it provides them, a, um, you know, to a certain extent, I think it, uh, I think institutions may, may view, end up viewing this as a solution of convenience that allows them to evade taking um, a more holistic um, responsibility around their own responses. I think that's a good launch pad into the last question. Um, which is about what? It's a very short comment, um, but one thing you hear a lot from um, residential colleges is that if people speak out publicly about uh, their experiences without the respondent having the opportunity to justify their experience, it can have long-term detrimental impacts that wouldn't necessarily occur if someone were able to go through the trial process. It's basically being guilty in the court of public opinion without actually having the opportunity to um, explain what your position is whether or not that's ethical or not is not relevant but it's just something to be mindful of um our, our final question we've only got a few minutes left goodness me um is how how do you think restorative what, or what role do you think restorative justice could play in a survivor's journey and um i'm grateful that a few of you have already talked um to this um, but Paula, I was wondering if, if you um, had some thoughts that you could share with us about that. You're still on mute, Paula, sorry. So how do I think restorative justice could help in a survivor's journey? Yeah, um, I think again, um, you know, to be heard and to be heard in a, in a safe environment. Um, I think some sense of, of closure. Um, it, it obviously will not be total closure, but um, you know, if, if there is some closure that will help support them, um, in a safe space, then, um, you know, I think that should be absolutely um, uh, supported. Um, and I think also, particularly for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, people, I think also, you know, to engage other identified services in our community um, and, and, and do that in, in the spirit of a united message. I think that would be really helpful and really um, powerful, uh, you know, for survivors, so that we show that there is a zero tolerance for this type of abuse, and there is a united message there as well. Um, you know, restorative justice practices—they um, need to be developed and supported, um, and support with you know, community healing and, 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 and that genuinely empower survivors. Um, you know, two of the reports that I've been kind of reading, they're old as anything, um, but, you know, Our Greatest Challenge by Hannah McGlade, you know, it's a, it's a book written from the heart and in personal experience. Um, and she says, while child sexual assault is a criminal offence, the Aboriginal experience of law is tainted. She said, despite reforms um, to the law, the courtroom experience is based on re-victimisation and trauma, you know, which prevents the fundamental principle of equality uh, before the law. So, and, you know, and, and another report, and look, and I don't know what's been happening, but this is a really, really important book. Um, it's... Um, it's the Aboriginal Child Sexual Assault Task Force. Now, that 
this book was written around that in 2003. It's quite a comprehensive grassroots book. Um, um, but, you know, it's, 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 we don't want to have to write another book about this, you know. Um, you know, we, we, we want to be able to um, get this message out there, this, you know, inclusive message, not be scared to, you know, to tell the truth and the truth telling. You know, and understanding all the complexities, you know, that, that do come with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, you know, Aboriginal and Torres, Torres Strait Islander communities, you know, add that on to the burden of carrying, you know, um, you know whatever shame and whatever guilt they do have, um, you know, being a survivor of, of sexual abuse. And I'm not sure if I answered the question, but that's kind of what I wanted to say. And I think I think we've reached the end of our time, unfortunately. It means that we won't have any time for for questions. And I'm sure there were some really wonderful questions. So I'm I'm sorry to everybody. Um, but it's been so wonderful to hear from each of you. And thank you so much for your time and your wisdom and your experience. We really appreciate it. Uh, so I think, Meredith, do the same rules apply? Um, that we've got a shorter break now before the next session commences. So it's due to commence um, at 11.05. So everyone's got a little bit of time to um, refresh themselves. Um, any, <clears throat> any other instructions I need to relay? Nope. No, all right. Well, um, we'll convene for panel three at, um, thanks very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, welcome back. I'm Meredith Rosner. Um, I'm a professor of criminology here at the ANU who does research on various aspects of restorative justice processes. Um, before we get started, I too want to acknowledge that I'm on Nunawal and Nambri land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So um, this, panel will in many ways be um, a response to what you heard in panel one and in panel two. Um, we heard a lot in panel one about the evolution of restorative justice in the ACT. And also it's important to recognize that we are very lucky here in the ACT to have a legislative basis for this process, which is rather unique. But it's also important to, to recognize that there's limits to what the restorative justice unit can currently do. So for instance, in supporting survivors who choose not to go through a formal justice process. In this panel, um, we will hear from a range of different examples from around Australia and globally about what restorative justice can look like for survivors, other pathways. So we hope that these insights can help us to reimagine how we can help survivors here in the ACT. So you'll first hear an excerpt of an interview that I recorded last week with Dr. Estelle Zinstag from Edinburgh. I still couldn't be here today because it's what, three in the morning in Scotland. Um, Estelle will give some examples of restorative justice approaches to sexual assault across Europe. We'll then hear from Thea Deacon Greenwood. Thea is a solicitor and the founder and project lead of Transforming Justice Australia, which is an organization that's been working tirelessly really to develop a survivor oriented restorative justice approach to sexual violence in New South Wales. Following that, Claire, Claire Berman Robinson, who's a restorative justice practitioner, will discuss the Adult Restorative Justice Conferencing Unit in Queensland. Claire has experience facilitating restorative justice in response to sexual violence, and will talk about the various pathways that are available for survivors in Queensland right now. Finally, we'll hear from Kendra Russell. Kendra is a community educator and trainer at the CASA House, that's the Center Against Sexual Assault, which is based out of the Royal Women's Hospital in Melbourne. Kendra supports survivors um, at all stages of, of, in their journey, and we'll discuss particularly how support organizations can work with and facilitate access to restorative justice. So I will start by um, hopefully successfully sharing this video with Estelle, which is just, just over five minutes long, and then I'll, and then I'll ask the panelists um, to engage. Please interrupt me if this isn't working.
So thanks Estelle, thanks for coming. Um, I'm just welcoming Estelle Zinsteg, who's a lecturer in criminology at Edinburgh Napier University. She's also a research fellow at University of Oxford and a senior research fellow at the um, KU Leuven in Belgium. She is, I would say, Europe's expert on restorative justice in response to sexual assault. She's, importantly for this group, she's just about to publish a major book which is a comparative study of restorative justice in response to sexual violence across many, most countries in Europe. Yeah, and beyond, too. Yeah. And beyond, Europe and beyond. I guess just to start, um, if you could talk a bit about um, what you've learned about what the different sort of pathways are to restorative justice in response to sexual violence. Um, yeah, so just to correct, the book is by Marie Keenan and myself, so oh. that's really important because it's completely collaborative work and actually we have a big team behind us. One of the, well, the premises to that project was the fact that we understood that despite so, the, the many res resistances, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the right word, word, word uh, to the idea of this practice, it actually in reality, in practice, really already happens. Mm -hmm. So, um, and everywhere in the world. The problem is always that uh, it's been done without proper checks and balances. The study was all about trying to find out as many answers as possible to this and then try to help the practice develop in a more yeah, safe and appropriate way in that sense. Um, pathways. Generally countries uh, like the Scottish government now want to try to make sure that it's only through the criminal justice system and only once someone is convicted. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, uh, my argument is that it, it, it's, it's too um, constricting. I mean, the point is, as we know, there's most studies show that about 5% of any sexual violence is ever um, going through the criminal justice system to a conviction. So what happens to the 95%? Let's take the example of historical um, sexual abuse, where, you know, 40 years later, a sister and a brother who, where there has been sexual violence, uh, you know, the sister doesn't really want her brother to go to prison, uh, doesn't really want it to be publicized, to be public, to be, but she wants answers and she wants to make sure, you know, she wants to answer what happened. Mostly it's about, you know, regaining a voice that you lost at that uh, during that um, event or series of events and you want to regain that voice you want to re-empower yourself and that can happen at any time in the course of your life uh, and by by making legislations that are extremely strict and uh, you 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 restrict and you take away again that voice uh, from these particular people the stakeholders should have the voice should have you know they know what's best for them it sounds like from what you're saying is that um, one of the key drivers of the difference is whether or not there's like a legis legislative basis. Of course, of course. Uh, we do say that a legislative, a legislative basis always allows a practice to, be, to become more embedded and to become more... Uh, we've seen so many countries where you had a, an amazing person being driven to develop the practice and to train people and to, you know, and, and that's the case in Denmark, that's the case in places in England. And then suddenly that person changes job, does something else, whatever, and the practice dies. Of course, it's, it's more difficult not to fund a practice if you have a legislative basis and a law says, you know, you have to give this possibility to uh, the stakeholders in a crime. I mean, especially the victim. I think I think there's not one solution, and I as I, I come back to the need to be flexible yeah. and to be adaptable to to the needs of the of the of the of the people who are who are affected and who who needs uh, you know it, and it's amazing because I, I I'm I'm now very involved in Scotland and I, I, I it's amazing to see these people who spontaneously these victims who spontaneously just desperately try to find someone to help them to do to talk to their offender in a safe way although the you know the practice doesn't exist here yet it's not allowed mm -hmm. and still they say but that's what i need to to move on in my life that's what i need to feel safe again that's what i need to for my voice to be heard for people in my family to understand that you know i didn't invent this you know and so, so how are kind of community organizations or NGOs or activists responding to that call in Scotland? 
in Scotland now, um, we um, this organisation Thriving Survivor, which is really working on trauma, um, and they they decided because there was so much resistance about the use of RG in cases of sexual violence, they decided to consult the survivors themselves. Uh, so uh, Scottish government funded this national consultation. So last spring, so it's very recent. It's just a few years, a few months old, and uh, it's a it's a large report that is now available online. It's this one here, <laughs> um, and it's the results are very very interesting because uh, they asked one of the questions they asked was, you know, should restorative justice be available? Would you would you be willing to have access to it if this if it was relevant to your case and and i think about 80 percent responded yes if your preparation is well done you know you know what is going to what might happen and you can really reduce the risk you never take all the risk away but you can really reduce the risk and and it was interesting for example in the alvas case in ireland where you know during the preparation they the, the facilitators went back to her and they said, but you know, you do understand he's not empathic, he empathetic, or he's not um he's not apologetic, he's not. Are you sure you want to meet him? And she kept on saying, but the only thing I want is answers to my questions. And uh, and uh, and so the, the meeting went ahead and indeed he was not empathic. He was he was really uh, very bland in his answers and but he answered all her questions and um and that's the thing at some point he apologized and she told him but that's not really that's not what i'm here for i don't want your apology you know so uh and i've heard that from other victims as well where apology is not what they need and not what they want and you know it's not part of the thing and forgiveness certainly not either it's what? not about that it's yeah. really not about that it's about creating a dialogue about creating offering a space a safe space for for answers maybe to discuss other things maybe to um yeah thank you okay so you will have seen from my dodgy editing skills that that's a shortened version of a much longer interview um which we'll also be making available on our website if anyone wants to watch that um that full interview at another time so um i'll start by um turning to thea first and asking Thea if you could offer some reflections on Estelle's remarks and perhaps talk a bit about the work that you've been doing with Transforming Justice Australia. No problem. Thanks, Meredith. And thanks um, so much for inviting me to be part of this wonderful day and this wonderful panel. I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm, I'm joining this um, group from Darug and Gundagara country in the Blue Mountains and my deep respects to Aboriginal elders who've um, helped support this program, any Aboriginal people listening to the aunties and survivors who have contributed so much so far. So thank you very much. And also my respects to survivors who are joining and listening to us today. Um, that was really amazing, Meredith, to have that opportunity to hear from Estelle. And I really love the way she continues to bring her focus back to the needs of survivors and to really see them as experts in their own lives and in the choices that they wish to make. Um, that really resonates for us at Transforming Justice Australia, which is an initiative that has been started by myself and my colleague, Dr. Jane Belitho, who's now um, the Diana Unwin. Uh, Chair in Restorative Justice at the University of Victoria in Wellington, New Zealand. Um, we've had so much support from the communities that we've been working in with the stakeholders that we've engaged with, also from the legal centre that I work at, the Central Tablelands and Blue Mountains Community Legal Centre, and really from survivors themselves who have reached out to us since we've started these conversations and dialogue and continue to share so much of their own stories and their own experiences with us and wanting to have these types of responses available for them. So we began the project um, a couple of years ago now with a really simple aim, which was to use a restorative justice lens to improve pathways to justice for survivors of sexual violence. And we also wanted to start a conversation about how restorative justice can provide those responses for survivors, but also for their families and communities, and can also create supportive pathways for people who have used harm into accountability. Um, we wanted to provide survivors with a response, also acknowledging that they may be at many different stages of a justice journey, um, and to make sure that our program did no further harm and really met their needs. 
partly our knowledge is informed by emerging evidence and practices from around the world, some of which Jane has researched, some of which I got to see in my Churchill Fellowship in 2019, um, but also from the emerging practices in Australia and in New Zealand and established youth practices as well. In my Churchill Fellowship, I saw amazing programs that um, many of which had been started in the community, many by survivors themselves, as Estelle was um, saying, and many that had just emerged organically in response to communities wanting to have solutions to solve problems like sexual violence. And for me, my clients um, of sexual and family violence have been really asking for a restorative opportunity for as long as I can remember. I can't tell you how many times a client has sat across from me and said, if only I could sit in a room with him and tell him what he did to me and how he ruined my life, um, that would be important for me. That's what I want. Um, I've also had many people say that they want to tell people, you know, what they need to feel safe moving forwards and to have responses from their friends and family that properly respond to their needs and understand and recognise and validate their experiences. So for me, I've really had that experience directly working with survivors in the community for as long as I can remember. Um, and in my view, and um, obviously so many people here today, this view, that offering a restorative response is really just an important part of our responses to sexual violence that should be on that menu or selection of, of what is available for people. And that we should continue to honour and centre the voices of survivors in how we design our programs, which is so beautifully expressed in the last panel, but also to centre our program responses and be very flexible to what survivors need at any point in their time. So in formulating our work and our program, we have tried to listen to survivors and centre their, their views. We have an expert panel of survivors, people with lived experience, also people who, use, who work with people who have used harm. Um, and we've looked at how we can work from within and also alongside criminal legal systems to make sure that we don't make assumptions about what justice means for a survivor and to support their decisions wherever they are at. Um, and of course, many survivors don't wish to engage in the criminal legal system. And we heard that really beautifully in the last panel as well. Um, obviously, many survivors don't ever report their experiences to the police and sexual assault, um, as, as has been reported so much this year, has got the highest rate of attrition through the criminal legal system, which means, you know, the, also the lowest rate of um, guilty verdicts. Obviously with um, child sexual abuse and sexual violence, we're also often talking about intrafamilial matters and sibling abuse, um, unfortunately does make up a very huge proportion of the experiences of um, childhood survivors of sexual violence. So there's obviously many, many reasons why people wouldn't want to report to the police or wouldn't have the person, wouldn't want the person to be incarcerated. Um, or even if they do go through that process, don't have a response at the end of it that they're happy with. Uh, so in recognising that, we've been speaking with the community directly to explore how restorative opportunities might better meet survivors' needs. We've been doing consultations in the community for over two years. We have met with hundreds, if not thousands, of individuals, survivors, agencies, frontline workers, um, you know, rape crisis centres, social workers, lawyers, judges, police. And in the last six months, particularly, we've been consulting very closely with youth stakeholders and have met with over 60 um, organisations working directly in the inner Sydney area, providing services to young people. So now we have a really clear model for how we can implement a program in New South Wales using the existing frameworks of the criminal legal system, but also incorporating a community um, referral. And um, hopefully we'll be supported in the future to implement that. In New South Wales, we don't have any legislation, so we can really create a model um, based on the leading practices in Australia, like some of the programs here today, as well as Open Circle in Victoria, and also draw on the research and the experiences of places overseas like Project Restore, and in the UK and Canada as well. So our approach is, is survivor-led. That's a really important central part of our work, which means that we work with survivors and their families. Um, we are flexible in that we can accept referrals from the community or from the police, also from a pre-sentence, post-plea setting, also post-conviction. 
Um, we'll provide a range of restorative responses. Uh, direct conferencing is only one of those. Um, it could be many other things that a survivor might want to have, um, information they might need to know, you know, assurances about the future. Um, and we'll also ask the survivor who they want to have in that restorative opportunity. It might be the person who harmed them directly. It might be other people. So it, our model is always flexible to what the survivor wants and to provide them with support. Um, our model is also community based, so we'll work with other community organisations as partners and in partnership in doing this work. And in doing no further harm, we obviously also support those who have used harm to help them find treatment and therapy and support. And I think we might talk about that a little bit further in this session as well, but obviously that's an important piece in the story about accountability. And it's often a very important piece in terms of ensuring that there's no further harm. So I will let other people um, talk, but yeah, look, I'm really delighted to be part of this. And I think it's really wonderful that we have these types of dialogues to recognize survivors as experts in their lives and to really see our role in a response setting as one of providing um, support to their choices and appropriate responses for their hopes and wishes for the future. So thank you so much. I'm really <laughs> looking forward to being part of this panel. No, thank you, Dee. I think, um, um, I think what you said resonates with a lot of people in this um, webinar today, but in particular, I think that you draw this, you draw out this tension around um, the, the idea that you have a lot of flexibility in your organization because you don't have a legislative basis, mm -hmm. and that means that you actually can offer community-based and, you know, criminal legal system-based um, responses, and I think that's something that perhaps um, it is a challenge actually when we're thinking about how to move forward. And, and so I might actually move to Claire now to ask Claire, um, you've worked with um, survivors and as a restorative justice convener in, in Queensland. Can you tell us a bit more about, um, about the pathways there and about what your experience has been like? Yeah, sure. And to start with, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm joining the symposium from Yugen Bear Country on the Gold Coast and paying my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, so I work for the Adult Restorative Justice Conferencing um, Service in Queensland and um, amazing Via to listen to the story of your organisation and, and um, all the great work that you're doing there and it really does sound very victim-centred and um, victim-led. I, I guess for us, we're a small team um, working in a few offices across Queensland and our service is used by police, mainly police prosecutions, police also pre-charge and the Director of Public Prosecutions as a diversionary service um, and we, we do RJ across a range of different offences and I guess sexual offending forms a very small part of the broader work that we do. So um, I guess often we're working in quite a challenging space because for sexual offending referrals that we get, they're mainly from the Director of Public Prosecutions and often they're in circumstances where, um, the, they're often in matters where there's likely to be a trial if, if the matter were to continue through the court system um, or DPP thinks that there's, there's not good prospects of a conviction, um, if a victim doesn't or a survivor doesn't wish to participate in a, in a trial process. So um, often it's kind of offered, you know, Thea, you talked about a menu and, the, and this being part of, or RJ, being on that menu that survivors can kind of look at and decide um, how they want to proceed. I think often for our referrals, it's not so much of a menu, it's, it's more an either or kind of selection. And it might be explained to them that, hey, you, the case isn't very strong and it's, you're probably not going to be successful through a court process. And that can be a really, really difficult and challenging space to work in um, and I guess part of the concern is that maybe that's continuing on something that's not very empowering for survivors to be in this situation where um, 
either they have to go through a court process that's likely to fail and be pretty traumatic or they could they could do this instead um i guess despite those challenges we too like there you, you talked about um being survivor led and and very flexible we approach yeah our processes in the same way where we're as much as possible um yeah working from survivor needs and wishes in the process and, and really designing the process around those needs and wishes um occasionally we do get referrals from survivors th themselves and they might have heard about our service through um, a specialist support service or a counsellor and those matters are really fantastic to work on because those survivors have often a really clear idea of what they're wanting to achieve and a really clear purpose and um, and and those matters really are fantastic to work with but I guess also the, the challenges that come up in those matters, especially if there isn't a criminal proceeding or other kind of court proceeding, or it's not within the, the, the justice system at all, is um, thinking about, you know, what's the stick or the motivation for the offender to want to participate and engage? Because I guess where it's coming from the DPP, there's a very clear motivation in that they'll have their charge discontinued and they won't be convicted because it's used to divert. Um, yeah, so um, a, a few different ways that, that we get referrals and kind of pros and cons with each pathway. Thanks, Claire. Um, I wonder if you could talk a bit about, you mentioned that support organizations um, and, and in particular, um, as you mentioned to me, the um, Brisbane Rape and Incest Survivor Support Centre, which is where Kendra used to work, <laughs> um, has been a, been a particularly kind of important relationship that you've, that you've developed over time. And I wonder if perhaps I could start by you talking about what, how working with that support organisation has, um, what that's meant for you, and then also then perhaps turn to Kendra to ask her to reflect on that a bit. Sure. Um, our organisation has been also, we're really looking at this area and working on how we can be better in this area and make sure that we're aligning with best practice. So Griffith University has done some research for us. Um, and one of the main recommendations coming out of the research around what best practice looks like in this area is that it's really important to involve specialist support services in restorative justice processes and we're not quite there yet in terms of having all those relationships set up and all of those services um, working with us but it's something that that we are working on so um, it, it's been really great to develop a really good working relationship with risk um, and having, having, I guess, you know, every survivor is different and it's really important that these processes are flexible. And I guess not every survivor will want to be, you know, some people are really clear that they don't want to be supported or that they don't want counselling or they, you know, that, that, that it's, yeah. And there are different ways that people may want to participate, but for some survivors, it's, the process can be really overwhelming, um, especially where there's a lot of trauma involved and having um, a counsellor or an advocate who is a specialist in that area that we can work with through the process um, in terms of supporting that survivor, relaying information, explaining things, Kind of going over things with them you know yeah who's a specialist in that area and can recognize things like trauma brain and people not taking in information or different kind of support that they might need that's been inc yeah incredibly helpful through our 
processes. Um, and I guess we've also learned that it's really important that any organisations that we are working with are like, I understand the process and are on board with what we do so that we're not kind of working at cross um, purposes. Um, the other great thing about the relationship with risk is that now they've started to talk to their, talk to their clients about restorative justice as an option and encourage people to seek information from police or say to police, hey, I, I, I want to go to restorative justice conferencing um, or, or raise it with them as a totally independent option where they might approach our service instead of going to the police if, yeah, or if they're not having a good experience with police. Um, so that has been a, yeah, a really great relationship. Um, and I'll just mention briefly, because I'm not sure, Thea, you might have had the same challenges, but I guess where, where there are quite a few services that we can quite easily um, access to help support victims, it's not as easy to find services to work with and support offenders in RJ processes. And that's, that's a real challenge that we're kind of grappling with as well in setting up this, looking at the recommendations and trying to implement them. Yeah, no, thank you. I think that's a particularly important question, especially if we're talking about community-based responses that, that I know that everyone's been, everyone on this panel has been grappling with in, in different ways. Um, I'd like to return to, to that because I think it's important to talk about. But first, I want to ask Kendra if she could um, kind of, because what you described, Claire, I think was a kind of really organic um, growth of this process in that through working with BRISC, it, it kind of, opened the um an avenue for a new form of pathway to restorative justice perhaps and i wonder kendra if that's something you could ex expand on a bit yeah absolutely um i'll also just acknowledge that i'm dialing in from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin nation um and pay my respects to elders past present and emerging and also just want to acknowledge um that so i'm currently in nam or melbourne um but a lot of the work i'm going to be talking about today um was birthed in yanjin or brisbane and so also want to extend my gratitude and thanks to um yagra and tribal elders there and that's really where i came to a lot of this knowledge and analysis and ideas around alternative justice um so yeah so i guess to contextualize my offering today um i was working as a, a counselor and support worker at brisk in brisbane which is a victim survivor sexual assault support service um, for adults and adult women um, and i now currently work as a community educator and trainer at casa house which is also a sexual assault service um, in melbourne cbd so there's there's going to be some kind of referring cross borders between queensland and victoria um, but i suppose the context of the story around how we came to have a relationship um, from brisk with adult restorative justice and with richard who was previously there and claire who were so um, gorgeous to work with is really that um, we encountered a, a particular victim survivor who had gone through the process that Claire just described of um, sort of imminently um, going through trial, the DPP kind of referring her um, to a restorative justice process, um, her feeling quite overwhelmed by it, seeking a victim support service, um, and that's how those ties really formed. Um, I guess I want to clarify one of the really unique things about BRISC is that BRISC, like many sexual assault support services, um, is a support service birthed out of the second wave feminist movement. And the unique thing about BRISC is it's still run as a feminist collectively run organisation. So the scope for organisational change and reorientation and sort of considering alternative forms of justice can happen at a much more kind of organic level than this very sort of hierarchical um, bureaucratic level at which you're sort of wrangling with ideas that are very much birthed out of you know Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, queer communities, and that can sort of filter into that organisation in a way that's quite different from other places. So that was really unique. Um, 
and and through that process for that particular victim survivor i suppose brisk really acted as advocates in that space for that particular victim survivor which i think speaks to the value of including um victim survivor services in this process because the value that these services play is very much in their history as feminist services that were birthed from like grassroots movements and that their strength is really in their feminist analysis of gender-based violence and also in their increasingly sort of trauma informed lens and it's the marrying of those two frameworks that I think make them really invaluable in these conversations and in supporting and playing a role for victim survivors. So for me, I think the, the lens or sort of the part that I wanna to bring to this conversation is really the importance of restorative justice, you know, organizations and processes really thinking about how can we embed and reach out to victim survivor services and, and work with them because we um, we very much, you know, and across Victoria and Queensland have amazing relationships with victim survivors that we see, um, you know, at all ages, at all different parts in, in their story and sort of reckoning with and healing and recovery um, from their experiences. And you know, my vision, and this is very much a personal vision that I'm articulating, is really that we consistently offer restorative justice as part of a victim survivor's rights when they access us. We talk them through reporting, we talk them through restorative justice, and we have sort of connections with organisations like Open Circle and Transforming Justice Australia that are very um, aligned and embedded to make it quite a seamless process um, because I suppose to, to really, I really resonate with Estelle's comments from her video where she's talking about this is happening, right? Like it is happening in Queensland with adult restorative justice conferencing. It is happening in Victoria with Open Circle, but those linkages between victim survivor services and these organisations um, are, uh, are really just just beginning and I, I really want to sort of yeah stress the importance of that um, and I think you know there was a question in an earlier panel around around fear um, of kind of recommending restorative justice to victim survivors and I think my kind of commentary um, from victim survivor services is that there is fear there because of the history of our services where um, you know women and other folks who are really crucial in setting up feminist sexual assault services had to fight so hard to get gender-based violence on the agenda and there's fear around that there's fear around restorative justice being seen as kind of reprivatizing that and i think we need to really acknowledge that fear and where it comes from, but also tap into the fact that feminist analyses are changing and they are in, in transforming and becoming more and more intersectional. We're able to, um, you know, to, to um, varying degrees of success when we think about intersectional analyses and including queer and centering queer and indigenous perspectives particularly, we're able to see all that restorative justice has to offer um and and that's kind of yeah that's the offering i want to make is really the importance of that how that analysis is transforming and how we still include those voices yeah thanks so much kendra i think to take um you know a theme running from both the cell video and, and what the three of you've been saying is that it's really clear that like like <laughs> that we need to be flexible and adaptable and, and organic and if we really do want to prioritize um, what survivors need and, and meeting survivors where they are. Um, and, and an important point, which I think was made by Miranda at the very beginning, which is that, you know, victim survivors are living in our community every day as our perpetrators, right? And, and that's why we really do need to, if we really do want to 
if justice heals, then we need to think about, um, you know, at what point in someone's journey that can take place. And that's why, for instance, the um, community-based alternatives, Thea, that you're, that you're trying to offer are, are become really important. Um, but with that comes some challenges. And both Claire and Thea have, have pointed out um, some particular challenges in terms of finding support for perpetrators in a non-criminal justice um, option. I wonder, Thea, if maybe you could reflect on that a bit. Um, thanks. Yeah, it's such a really um, cool conversation to be a part of. I feel very privileged to be in everybody's company here, but um, there's lots of common themes. But yeah, look, that is a, a definite challenge in doing community-based work. Um, in my view, it's a public health issue. It requires public funding, commitment to evidence-based programs and treatment. Um, there's a lot of uh, literature with, um, you know, what is available in terms of community treatment models, which are effective. Um, one, one is COSA, which is Circles of Support and Accountability that support people usually exiting from criminal um, justice institutions back into the community. Um, they are only available in one state, as far as I'm aware, in Australia, which is, is woeful. Um, there's also just no public, in New South Wales at least, there's no publicly accessible um, treatment for people who have used sexual harm in our communities if they're over 18. Um, that, that is a real problem. Um, also, if they're under 18 and they have been charged, they also cannot access the public health um, new street services. In other states and territories, it's obviously might be different um, and people might have different experiences, but many services and programs also bar people who, um, you know, accept accountability for causing harm. Um, and so there's lots and lots of barriers for people who have used harm who may be genuinely help seeking. Um, just as survivors live and work in our communities, people who are responsible for harm do too. And it is just a public health um, problem that we don't have better services and supports for all people who have used harm who may want to step into a space of being accountable. Um, and I think as advocates for um, programs and responses that do no further harm, we need to be advocating as well for the needs of people who have used harm. So it is definitely a challenge. Um, we seek to work with organisations that, um, you know, reduce those barriers and that work um, you know, from a community and grassroots level with people who are responsible for harm, who are stepping into a space to wanting to, to receive it. But it is an ongoing challenge. Um, and probably other states and territories have got different um, responses there in terms of that piece. But there is some evidence about what is useful for people who have used particularly harmful sexual behaviours. And we just need more of more community-based access, yeah. Claire, Kendra, do you um, have anything else to offer? With that? Um, yeah, I just sort of, I guess, both echo um, some of the comments that have already been made around the lack of services. I mean, for us, really, when when we've kind of looked, I suppose, at referring um, people using harm to services, the only sort of model that's available is very much men's behavioural change, um, which is very much oriented around um, domestic and family violence. And I suppose a point that I want to make here is that kind of in the literature and as I've engaged with academics in these sorts of conversations, there can be a real um, lack of awareness around the differences between sexual violence and domestic and family violence mm -hmm. that I think really needs to be named as a distinction because um, obviously there are links in so far as the you know, intimate partner um, sexual violence exists and interfamilial and incest, um, but sexual violence broadly can contain many, many different dynamics um, and often with kind of an absence or a difference in the way that coercive control is either present, negotiated or not present. And so um, when we are sort of supporting survivors and thinking through restorative justice options, um, in a way where their experience may not be captured by the domestic and family violence lens, there is absolutely a lack of sort of services or any support um, for people causing harm. Um, so I think that's, yeah, a really significant piece. And I, I do also just want to plug here, though, um, Open Circle, who, um, you know, runs a program here in Victoria as part of the Innovative um, Justice Centre, they, from, from talking to them and engaging with them, they are developing or have quite an interesting model that involves accountability specialists. 
and I, I can't really sort of speak to, I guess, the specifics of what that looks like for sort of recovery for people using harm. But I think, yeah, I just wanted to plug them and the, the very innovative work they're doing in that space. Yeah, thanks. Very important, very important group. Claire? Um, I guess from a convener perspective, uh, processes can be really difficult where offenders don't have adequate support because um, because I guess we're asking people to take responsibility for something that is, you know, where there is so much harm caused and because there is so much stigma around being a rapist or some, or, a, you know, someone who sexually assaulted someone else. Um, without that support, offenders find it can find it very difficult to feel safe to be vulnerable to take responsibility for their actions um, and also to, and also I guess that specialist support can be really important in helping offenders to unpack um, a lot of their own beliefs around consent and what that means and um, because often, in, you know, I, and I guess in the referrals that we see where it's a matter that's probably would have gone to trial and it's an issue probably around mistake of fact and whether there was consent, pe offenders have it kind of are a bit confused about what went wrong and why it is that they've ended up in the criminal justice system. So, um, yeah, I guess <laughs> from my perspective, being able to, if we can, and we, we haven't so far been able to get that specialist support involved in our processes, unless people have gone and privately seen a counsellor mm -hmm. and, and done their own work, which sometimes mm -hmm. they do, and that's really, really good. Um, but yeah, it would just make such a difference, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I guess not only for, for offenders and making sure that we're not causing any further harm for them, because often those people are going through some really intense mental health stuff themselves. Like it's not unusual for those offenders to be suicidal, um, for, you know, their relationships to have broken down, all kinds of things. They might have lost their job. Um, and I guess helping them to better perform and better engage in our process will then assist survivors to get better <laughs> outcomes too. Because that person will be in a better place to take responsibility to apologise, to talk about their insight into impacts, to understand, to hear. Um, so, yeah, incredibly important. And I agree, Thea, you know, we need funding to provide <laughs> this, this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and there was one other point I wanted to make, but it's, it's gone. I think that um, what you're saying actually resonates with a couple of questions that we're having right now from the group. So I might just um, ask, ask Helen to ask a, to uh, moderate a couple of questions, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the first question we have is from Janet Hope. Uh, so regarding Claire, what you said earlier about the relationship with risk, how important does the rest of the panel feel it is for survivors to have a counsellor or other specialists working with them through the RJ process? And what formal or informal assessments are made as to the risks of re-traumatisation and self-harm, for example, in the absence of such support? Can, I think I could answer the bit about um, the, the risk of further harm and then maybe if I... And then Thea and Kendra. Um, so I suppose from a convener perspective... It can be really challenging um, and at the moment we don't have a formal risk assessment. It's really just talking through with the survivor what they're hoping to achieve, what support they do have, talking through and also managing expectations in terms of what is achievable, how the offender is presenting, if that person is going to be able to meet their, their needs and expectations. But, but I guess we don't want to 
be, be disempowering survivors further by forcing them to engage in a support service or a counselling service if they don't want to. Um, because that's just, again, yeah, taking away their power and telling them what they have to do. But I guess we can have those open conversations as conveners saying, look, I'm, I'm really concerned, I'm worried that this is going to cause you further harm. Um, what are your thoughts? And, yeah, try and be transparent as possible in having those conversations. And some people a bit further down the line through the process are more open to getting support. For example, they may decide that they want to participate in a conference by providing a victim impact statement, and then they may be open to us referring them to a specialist service to help them with, with putting that um, statement together. Thea or Kendra, do you have anything to add? Yeah, Thea, do you want to, do you, do you, you uh, go for it? After you, Kendra. Okay. After you. <laughs> I think um, one distinct, like one thing I want to kind of distinguish, I've just got the question in front of me, how important does it feel for people to have a counsellor? Um, there's two things I want to offer here. One is that I think it's really important to sort of talk about restorative justice as this sort of formalised um, alternative justice process and kind of have in our minds what transformative justice is and to really quickly kind of name that it's very informal community driven justice processes that don't that don't have sort of structure um, services around them and so there are ways that victim survivors seek justice in their community all the time um, that might look like you know telling your friends and not having um, you know a perpetrator or person coming causing harm attend a party or an event <laughs> You know, there's a myriad of ways. And so for me, um, yeah, victim survivors are already experts in the sense of their own justice. And so kind of forcing them or, or you know, really kind of persuading them to connect with a counsellor isn't necessary or helpful at all, particularly. Um, and I just kind of like want to honour that story. Um, I think the other piece that I want to add is really around the notion of structuring safety and structuring safety into a process. And so I think the most effective way that we can support survivors through processes like these are giving them options and flexibility to determine and have their own self-assessment of their own safety, their own sort of tra trauma um, on it at every stage. And so that might look like an initial, did you want to connect with a counsellor? It could look like A, B, C. And making sure options like those are, um, yeah, are really implemented across the entire process in a way that honours victims' power, control, um, and, and decision-making over the process. So for me, um, I, I'm, the language of risk can be useful, but actually I prefer the language of structuring safety and structuring options because I think that results in sort of better outcomes. Thanks, Kendra. I was going, uh, both of what you've said, it just answers that question so perfectly. Um, the only piece that I'd like to add is um, the question of accountability in when we talk about accountability often um, in these kinds of conversations, we're talking about what that means in a public setting and in a public space. And as Kendra just said, you know, it's really important that we ask survivors what accountability means for them and what justice means for them. And that might be quite different to what we, um, you know, we in the kind of greater community or uh, discourse or people reading a, a newspaper or whatever might think justice looks like. And that those things are very, can be very personal, and very individual, and that we need to recognise, um, yes, the, the survivors as experts always and, and can bring those questions always to them first and continue to honour that, as, as Kendra said, all the way through any process. Thanks, thanks very much, Thea. That's a very um, clear and coherent message, I think, throughout this whole panel. Um, thank you all so much. Um, really, really inspiring to hear um, from the hard work that you guys have been doing for years already. Um, and, and we hope to continue these conversations down the line. We'll have a four minute break now um, and we'll come back with the final panel, which will bring everything together. So 
Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Okay, it's just gone 12. I'm wondering if our panelists for session four can put on their videos and join me. Hi, Amanda, how are you? Hi, welcome. Thank you. Just waiting for Leah. Leah was with us earlier, but I can't see her here, Amanda. So I'm, I'm going to email her and. Um... Okay. All righty. So we'll kick off anyhow. And <clears throat> so this panel, uh, panel four, is convening to address the question of what is needed to safely advance survivor initiated <clears throat> restorative justice as a pathway, both inside and outside the criminal justice system. So. <clears throat> Excuse me, we've had the benefit of um, hearing some amazing speakers all through the morning, which is going to help inform our discussion in this next um, session. So what I'll do first up is introduce our speakers. So our five panellists in this last session include Mr Shane Drumgold, the current Director of Public Prosecutions. Welcome Shane. Detective Sergeant Michael Woodburn, or Mick, who has begun work in the ACT Policing Sexual Assault and Child Abuse Team. Thanks for joining us, Mick. And we have Claudia McLean, who is the Principal Solicitor with the Women's Legal Service. Glad you can be here with us, Claudia. So what I might do is just pass to each of you to perhaps tell us a little bit about how you, you know, where you're from, how you've arrived at the position that you're currently in, what your experience of restorative justice might be, or your experience of working with survivors of sexual assault. So Claudia, maybe I can start with you first. Sure, thanks Amanda. So uh, at the Women's Legal Centre, we work with a lot of women who are considering making a formal complaint to police. And so they wanna know a lot about the process before they embark on that. We also have an employment and discrimination practice. And so with that, um, particularly with a lot of our sexual harassment work, there also is a um, sexual assault victim survivors that are often um, getting advice around those processes as well. The majority of our work at the centre is in the family law, family violence space, which of course overlaps with sexual assault space, but we also work with victim survivors with our uh, support for those cohorts to make claims for financial assistance um, through victim support services as well. So we also have a specialist Aboriginal women's access to justice program as well. And a lot of that work is involved um, with early intervention care and protection work, which of course overlaps with sexual assault. So from many, many practice areas, we can see just how pervasive um, sexual assault is in so many different jurisdictions and practice areas. Thanks, Claudia. Shane, if we, if we turn to you, could you just tell us a bit about your background? Uh, sure, so um, I've been a prosecutor for 20 years, a career prosecutor. I had the benefit about, um, oh gosh, 16 years uh, ago now uh, doing a Churchill Fellowship on restorative justice, particularly focusing on Indigenous communities through North America. Um, what led me to do that, uh, probably four or five years into my role as a prosecutor, was touched on pretty eloquently uh, by Kendra in the last session, talking about transformative justice when it became clear about two or three years in as a prosecutor that we need to kind of manage expectations about what the criminal justice system can offer victims by way of emotional resolution. Um, and uh, it, it can offer some relief, but not long-term emotional resolution. And that started my search to look for other ways that can operate um, with a criminal justice system. Um, criminal, the criminal justice system is about 
proofs and presumptions of innocence and establishing things beyond reasonable doubt and offering mitigation in sentences. It's not about emotional resolution um, for victims. And that's kind of what led my interest about 15 years ago to look uh, at alternative ways. And it's an interest that I kind of maintain today. Although again, uh, um, I'm equally conscious uh, about in session two, what Nina Fennell offered. We, we know that when there is something like this, that we need to be cautious because social forces can conspire to encourage a victim to favour certain options over other options. It's not just, we're just not offering a list of equal options for victims. So we, we need to apply caution in, in how we progress through this. Thanks, Jane. Mick, if I turn to you, could you tell us a little bit about your journey and where you are, getting to where you are now? Uh, yeah, sure. So my name is Detective Sergeant Mick Woodburn. I'm one of the three team leaders in charge of our sexual assault and child abuse investigative capacity within ACT policing. Uh, I've only been here for a short period of time, but I've got 13 years worth of experience uh, nearly solely in a community policing um, capacity here in Canberra. I've uh, had quite a bit of dealings with restorative justice, particularly um, when dealing with juveniles and when dealing with uh, less serious offences. I think we all acknowledge that the use of restorative justice for more serious offences, and particularly in the context that we're discussing now with sexual assaults, um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, not, it's not as useful, but that's not to say that it doesn't have um, potential. Um, one thing I really wanted to acknowledge was uh, first and foremost was um, Matisse and her courage and her presentation to open the um, uh, today. I wanted to really say thank you to her. Um, I acknowledge her comments around her interactions with police and that she found it difficult to deal with us and that she didn't feel in control through um, all of her dealings with us. Um, I would love to learn from her experience. And I will reach out to her um, through Miranda uh, or yourself, Amanda, and I offer you our apologies for our role in the way that your interaction with us made you feel. Um, when it comes to police and the way that we deal with victims of sexual assault, we're here to help. That's what we need to focus on. We need to be victim led. And we need to be very honest in our dealings with sexual assault victims. And sometimes that honesty can be difficult. We look at criminal prosecutions, and I understand and accept that police will be judged on successful convictions, successful prosecutions. But I'm also very clear right about the fact that that is not necessarily a measure of our success. What we need to do is we need to help people in need. And that means that we need to be led by victims. We need to inform victims. And I'll go back to Matisse's words, which I thought were, were really, really succinct. When she was looking at the restorative justice option, she asked herself, is this option going to be helpful for me? And in all of our interactions with sexual assault victims, that's what we have to have front of mind. Are the options that we are providing or the information that we're providing or the gateways that we're providing to survivors of sexual assault helpful for them? And that's going to mean different things for different people and we have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. So while I say earlier that I accept the judgment of police with respect to prosecutions and matters put before court, in our eyes, we are here to help and that's not always going to be referral to the criminal justice system. Um, I think Mr. Grum, Mr. Drumgold um, summed up very, very well when he clearly said that managing the expectations of victims when it comes to dealing with the criminal justice system is a real key responsibility for us. Because for the 3% of successful convictions that we have, there's 97 out of 100 other women or other victims out there that haven't been captured within that process. So how is it that we can help those people? And that's where I see restorative justice playing a very, very key role. How can we have some sort of a therapeutic or a positive outcome for the 97 other victims that don't have any involvement with the criminal justice system? 
Um, and, and, and that's, that, that they're my initial views and I'd, I'd love to take any other questions that, that, that people have got in terms of the way that police deal with sexual assault victims and how we can assist to provide positive outcomes. Thanks, Mick. Okay, um, Ms. Leah House has joined us. Hi, Leah, welcome. Um, I've been asking each of the panellists just to give a, ver a very brief sort of understanding of uh, how you've arrived at your current position. You're the um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Victim Liaison Support Officer with Victim Support ACT. A little bit of background like where you're from and what's led you to the, the current position, if you've had any experience of RJ or working with survivors of sexual assault. Um, hi, sorry, I was having trouble getting on. Um, but yeah, my name is Leah. I'm um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Victim Liaison Officer at Victim Support. Um, with Heidi Yates' amazing team. Um, I worked prior to this with Claudia McLean at the Women's Legal Centre, where I was a part of the Malia Mara Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Women's Access to Justice Program. Um, so it's definitely a space that I've gravitated towards, also as a survivor of DV and sexual assault myself. So I do use a lot of my lived experiences to help guide me towards um, the career pathway, I guess, that I've been on for several years now. Um, so I guess I'll start with, I'm a Nambri woman. I live here in Canberra on my ancestral lands. I work here and I'm raising my children here. Um, but I think I wanted to like just kind of um, outline my perspective on this conversation. Um, and that is that it is a huge conversation, it's massive. Um, and that I sought advice from my elders um, as to whether engage and if so, how to engage in this. Um, and I'd like to start with acknowledging that while I am present today and I respect the need for representation of First Nations voices um, on a panel dedicated to First Nations people on this conversation delivered by First Nations voices needs to be created and prioritised. Um, we know our people are targeted and criminalised from birth. Um, contact with the criminal justice system is traumatic, whether as a survivor, a victim, a perpetrator, perpetrator or accused. Um, the system aggravates already existing trauma. Um, we have the statistics that paint this clearly. Uh, it's a reflection on our systems, our services, colonisation, um, that have failed our people every step of the way in the creation of this um, so-called Australia. We cannot move forward without being placed in the driver's seat. First Nations people cannot remain in the back seat and don't need to be thankful for a passenger seat. Um, it is not, it is now and has always been our right to steer our futures. So with that, I believe for First Nations people, a dedicated panel um, following on from this to explore this discussion in depth is necessary. So I'm done. Sorry, Amanda, Amanda you're on mute. <laughs> thank you, Leah. Um, and thank you all of the panellists for being here. W what I'd like to do now is um, look at, because I think we've got to the point where we, we know that restorative justice is a service that um, should be available. It's like, how can it be available? How can it be accessed? how can pathways be grown? Um, and in our preparations earlier this week, Shane, we were talking about some of the potential conflicts or barriers. Um, would you like to discuss what some of those conflicts might be um, for pathways to restorative justice in the criminal justice system as you see it? Sure, um, thanks Amanda. Um, so, we need to start by looking at the objectives of restorative justice and the objectives of the criminal justice system because those two things don't align. Um, the objectives of restorative justice, as I touched on initially, really is victims' emotional resol uh, resolution. Objectives within the criminal justice system are much more structured and they're really about whether or not a prosecutor can prove something beyond reasonable doubt within a very uh, kind of limited construct with lots of rules and lots of regulations. So, you know, there's presumptions of innocence through to the proof of guilt, but beyond the proof of guilt through the sentencing process, you're really kind of 
you've, you've got a, a, a dichotomy between two people. One party, their role is to mitigate, to reduce the sentence. The other party's role is to aggravate. Lost in the middle of all of that is a victim and an offender that need repair. Um, so whilst we're battling out in an adversarial system, we're losing all of that, gray, we're not focusing on all of that grey area in the middle, um, which is, as I say, emotional resolution of both the victim and the offender. Um, that's where restorative justice sits. So the question is how those two things can reconcile, how, the criminal, how an adversarial criminal justice system can reconcile between human beings seeking emotional resolution for an event. Um, and uh, I'm not sure that it can. I'm not sure that the criminal justice system, an adversarial criminal justice system, is the place to seek and achieve that emotional um, resolution. In fact, the rules are against it. You know, the, the rules are, are all around, as I say, presumptions of innocence. Even um, the, the victims of crime legislation is great, but it places obligations on me, for example, to do what I can do to reduce face-to-face -face contact between offenders and victims. So the whole system is not geared toward it. Um, when I did my Churchill, um, this is a, a tug of war that many countries and many areas struggle with, and that is whether or not restorative justice sits within the justice system or it sits outside of the justice system in more of a, through more of a truth and reconciliation prism. And I think answering the question of the pathway to it, I think that's really the fundamental question we have to, um, we have to struggle with, and that is where it sits vis-a-vis -vis the criminal justice system. So, unlike other jurisdictions, the legislation here in the ACT <coughs> governing restorative justice is very flexible and allows referral pathways at all points in the criminal justice system. So, as you were saying, there's, if that referral comes from um, the DPP or the courts while a matter is going through, of course, it has to come after a person has um, accepted some responsibility. If it's a serious offence, it has that referral has to come only after a plea of guilt or a finding of guilt has been established. So the, what you're saying is that the tensions that exist if a matter is referred while a court process is going are, are maybe too great to overcome. What we know about the RJ legislation is that there's a secrecy clause that protects all of the information, everything that's said in that conference and preparation. And it's only an agreement, if an agreement, a written agreement comes out of that conference, that that can be forwarded to uh, the judiciary. Um, and I suppose in much the same way as there are mitigations for early plea, et cetera, there, there can be, not, it doesn't necessarily have to happen, but um, people who have offended can get mitigations for having shown responsibility and successfully participated in restorative justice. So do you see that some of those tensions or conflicts might be uh, um, uh, surmountable um, if everybody respects the role that each, each other is playing in that process? I guess the short answer is no. Uh, and the reason for that is it's more than just about the admissibility of evidence, it's the mindset that someone takes to a situation. So it's highly unlikely that someone in the mindset of producing mitigation to reduce the penalty for something that happens in a court system, that that mindset can also occupy a focus on reparation and what they can do for the victim. Um, because it's not just about exchange of information between the two areas, between the restorative justice area and the criminal justice system. It's really about the mindset of the participants uh, and shifting that mindset. Everybody through, going through the criminal justice system is really about defending their territory and, and, and about, you know, as I say, pouring through the facts from the defence perspective to offer mitigation to reduce the sentence. And that involves minimising the harm. Necessarily, it involves minimising the harm. Now, to have to be minimising the harm by offering mitigation through a criminal justice system, it's hard to occupy that mental space and then turn up to restorative justice and acknowledge the harm. 
Um, so the two things do not sit comfortably together. Thanks, Shane. Um, Mick, if I turn to you next, are you still with us? <laughs> You've gone off video there. Yeah, no, you've still got me. Um, yeah, um, we were hearing earlier about the vast proportion of um, survivors who never report to police and then and also of the, the very high proportion that are unable to progress through to prosecution. Has that been your experience and understanding? Uh, absolutely. Um, there's there, there is, there's no overriding, there, there, there's many reasons for why a matter does not progress from being reported to police all the way through to a, a criminal prosecution. Um, we can talk about that for a very long time, but uh, in the context, I'd, I'd like to keep it specific to the context and the, um, and the purpose of restorative justice. And the purpose of restorative justice is to deliver some form of resolution or some form of a positive outcome, uh, which is more so victim focused rather than ensuring the administra administration of criminal justice in a fair and impartial manner. Um, <coughs> some sexual assault victims, I I'm sure that everybody understands perfectly well um, how this works. But some sexual assault victims that report their matters to police, that is all that they want. Some sexual assault victims that report their matters to police wish to come forward and have the cathartic experience of participating in an evidence in chief interview. And at the conclusion of that, they don't want to proceed. Some victims wish to simply tell their story in the possible event that there are other victims out there so that we can be informed. Some people will get to the criminal prosecution phase and decide that a criminal prosecution, in the words of Matisse, is not an option that's going to be helpful for them going forward. That we find is nearly, is, is the majority of the reasons why we don't progress a lot of our matters. There is also always the context of meeting the, um, the evidential thresholds that are required for us to A, put a matter before the court, with um, prospects of a successful conviction, and then actually achieving that successful conviction. Once a matter is before court, we do find it is a very traumatic process for our victims. It can be a positive outcome for them. It can be a very negative outcome for them. So we have a very clear responsibility to ensure that our victims and our survivors of sexual assault walk into these processes very well informed. Part of in a part of providing that information to um, survivors and victims results in them walking away from the criminal justice system, and we will support them because we need to work being victim led and victim informed. So, Mick, you'd be comfortable referring um, survive victim survivors to a community based restorative justice if those op options and pathways existed in the community. We'd be comfortable with, with, with any framework that results in a positive outcome for victims and survivors. At the end of the day, we also need to be very clear right about the fact that a restorative justice type framework could well have a very negative impact for or outcome for victim survivors as well. Every case is a case by case basis and the restorative justice of unit obviously is, uh, will, would have to have frameworks in place to minimise the likelihood of that, of that occurring. Um, uh, but like I said before, the, the matters, as it currently stands, there is an inherent link between our referrals to restorative justice at the police level and also at the court level. And that is inherently linked to the likelihood of a successful prosecution. That only captures five, three to five percent of the matters that we know that are out there, the police know that are out there. And there are more matters on top of that. Mm -hmm. So, I, I don't know what the solution is, but the scope is so much greater than that. And how do we provide uh, effective, positive outcomes for the 95% of um, survivor victims out there that would not be captured in the way that we've traditionally looked at restorative justice? Thank you. Leah, um, if we're contemplating 
uh, the provision of restorative justice processes in the community. Um, what sort of framework do you think, or what sort of things would be really important to be part of that for it to be considered appropriate for <clears throat> people that you would be working with? Um, I think it would definitely need to be survivor led um, and the, the conversation moving forward would we need to centre survivors within this discussion, I believe. Um, and it, I think for community and not all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people want to access Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander services. I think that's something to kind of mention. Um, but I do work in the context of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that identify and want to access Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander services so that's like the area that i work in so i can really only speak on those clients that i work with um, i believe a service it would need to be first nations led it would need to be delivered by first nation services that currently do not exist um, yeah I, I can't really expand too much more on that just because i think it it needs to be first nations led if it's a service that's going to be offered to first nations victim survivors um, offenders, perpetrators, users of um, violence. It, we need to centre anything to do if we're trying to pick up those that cohort. It needs to be delivered by First Nations people, like I stated at the beginning. I do believe that it's overdue now for First Nations people to be um, in the um, driver's seat steering these conversations and the delivery of these services. Thanks, Leah. Claudia, if, if we're contemplating community-based restorative justice and, and some of the criticisms are that it will be seen as a light option or not quite as formal or serious, I know that you've been exploring a potential for lawyers to be advocates for uh, survivors in, in court processes, perhaps that was, but do you see that there's a role perhaps for um, people with legal backgrounds to be part of a support network um, for survivors in community restorative justice processes. Yeah, absolutely, Amanda. And I think that the role of lawyers is a really interesting question, particularly if we look at other areas of law outside a, a criminal uh, jurisdiction. And I think the, the two things in this space which are important is one, understanding the role of lawyers and their focus on process, not just advocacy, but also the importance of specialist legal services. And as Leah mentioned, um, we, we don't have a specialist um, Aboriginal legal service that's owned by Canberra that is particularly working exclusively in this space and that is community led, um, but also the importance of specialist services who operate in a trauma informed um, victor survivor focused way. Um, conversations Shane and I had the other, the other day in um, our panel discussion was around, yes, the DPPs for the community, an offender has their own lawyer, but a victim who is the centre of the process actually doesn't have their own advocate in that, in that process. And as Shane mentioned, um, the criminal justice pathway being very, very different from a restorative justice pathway. And so I think the role of lawyers could play such an important role as it does in other um, areas of practice where lawyers aren't just a mere mouthpiece for their clients. They have um, very strict professional duties to the profession itself, to the judiciary. Um, but and what that means is a big role lawyers play is weighing up with obviously with the client the advantages and disadvantages of a certain course of action for that client and so it is a very tailored approach um, and ultimately it is the client's decision we can't act without clients instruction so as has been echoed throughout this entire panel it has to be victim led but lawyers actually have a duty that we, we can't act without those instructions so that is embedded in a lawyer's role um, but a big role that lawyers play is which i think people don't necessarily think about when they think about a lawyer in in a process system is that we are all about fair processes and a lot of beyond let's say an advocate's role what a lawyer brings to the process is a focus on that process to be fair to be transparent to be aligned with um, legislative frameworks and to understand those frameworks and those principles of natural justice or administrative law principles so that there's an opportunity to respond, that there are appeal processes built in within a, within a system which maximises opportunities for that process to be really tested um, and for that transparency and accountability to be paramount in those processes. Um, the other thing a lawyer brings to the table is we're trained to think about risk. 
Um, and I think, you know, lawyers, they'll probably be the most risk averse people you'll ever meet, um, which comes with its disadvantages as well. But I'm not just talking about physical risk or psychological uh, safety, but actually risk about preserving rights in other jurisdictions. So I think in a restorative justice framework, yes, we've talked a lot about a criminal law jurisdiction, but we know victim survivors are often involved in many jurisdictions. Um, women who have experienced sexual assault and family violence can have up to 10 legal problems at a time. And so how does one course of action impact upon a victim survivor's course in, in other ways? And how can can you maximise um, an outcome that the victim survivor, survivor wants and that's negotiated with, with the lawyer and how what's the lawyer's role in, in trying to bring that outcome to fruition and really taking an outcomes-based approach. So to answer your question in that space, I think lawyers can definitely bring a lot to the table um, because they do bring a different perspective and that's got to be within a broader, more holistic approach with other specialist services as well. So of course, um, your therapeutic supports and whatnot. Um, but also the role of specialist services, it is absolutely crucial that any services operate from that trauma-informed lens. Um, the last thing anyone wants is a process to create further trauma uh, damage um, to a client's end. Also, from a lawyer's perspective, you know, we, we do want people to have faith in our systems and processes. Um, so I think there's a whole whole range of considerations there, but there's absolutely a space for specialist legal services for victim survivors. Thanks, Claudia. Um, my next question I'll just throw out and whoever maybe wants to um, answer it, have, have a go. If we're contemplating community-based restorative justice for survivors of sexual assault, where should that be embedded? Do, do we think it should be embedded in um, survivor support service type organisations? Should it be in a neutral space that invites all those players in? Where should that, where sh or, or should it be more organic and should there just be many, many pathways and, and options to accessing um, restorative justice in more informal settings? I'll, I'll have a shot at that. I, I, I think um, embedded in that is who all those players are. And, and this is a really important question. Who has a stake in sexual offences um, and often we get we narrow the people with a stake to the victim and the offender and the immediate um, surrounds the, the family but the reality is it affects the community you know if there is a a, a sexual assault public, publicized on saturday night the following saturday night many many yeah, particularly young females will change their life decisions based on that event. Um, so the, uh, the, the question is who, who uh, has an interest in it? The entire community, the, the weight of the interest narrows down to a focus on the victim and they definitely have the, the, the greatest interest in it, but a lot of people have an interest in it. Um, and that creates the issue of uh, how these things occur, whether they occur in camera and away from the view of the community or whether they, the outcomes um, are in the total view of the community. Um, so I know, for example, in Canada, um, most of the restorative justice initiatives are, are run by community-based organisations and they do it specifically because they say the community has a stake in this event. Um, here, we tend to have siphoned them off to a small government institution, the Restorative Justice Unit or the Human Rights uh, Commission. So uh, the fundamental question, as I say, is who has the interest in it? And that should inform the question of who, who has a stake in, in the um, process itself. Mm. Thanks, Jay. Did anybody else want to? Um, I think with um, for First Nations people, the law, um, the fam family law, the criminal justice system, care protection, all these systems that are in place um, are often weaponized against First Nations people. So it's 
and I think that was why it was really um, an interesting time spending um, my time with the Women's Legal Centre to be able to find um, a pathway to navigate the systems utilising lawyers um, and to use these systems and lawyers um, as vehicles to find justice for First Nations women, which was the capacity I was doing that for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and their families to um, strengthen their families and respect respect their capacity to strengthen themselves and their families. Um, but I do find it difficult for a lot of our community to um, find justice um, and in, in the context of sexual assault and restorative justice to potentially find, um, what's the word, um, closure, or I guess not total closure, but a level of closure within the justice system. I don't believe it's possible to find that for First Nations people 99% um, of the time within that framework of the criminal justice system. So. Um, I think for First Nations people, and I, that's why I think a panel following on from this with First Nations voices is vital to this conversation um, because it would be interesting to hear from other people in community what um, they their thoughts and insights on this because um, for myself, I think um, something like this would have to steer clear of the criminal justice system for First Nations people for it to truly work and to heal our people. Mm. Um, Paula McGrady previously spoke <coughs> about <coughs> some of the particular issues for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders' privacy being one of those <coughs> key factors. And, and of course, the community maybe being uh, not a large community, how do you maintain privacy of what's happening for particular people and, and some of the uh, impacts and the stigma and the, the, the consequences. So. Perhaps, <clears throat> yeah, having systems that provide multiple pathways and options for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community, recognising how diverse it is even here within, within Canberra uh, is important too. Um, um, just what, on that, the, it, uh, yeah, I think that's really key that um, the justice systems we have in place do not work for our people and we know that. Um, we, we know that and we have the evidence of that. And the reality that our um, justice system and AMC in particular, but across the nation, um, our correctional centres are housing traumatised and marginalised First Nation men, women and children, our babies also um, 10 years old and up are being locked up. Um, and they're further perpetuating trauma on them while they're in these institutions and they're not equipped in them to reintegrate back into community upon their release in, at all. Thanks, Leah. Mick, would you have concerns about community restorative justice options not having access to risk information, criminal histories, uh, et cetera, to, to fully understand what, what sort of uh, risks might be involved in running Absolutely. a process? Absolutely. And, and that comes back to the discussion about the potential for great um, positive outcomes, but also the potential for great negative outcomes for this type of a framework if it's not done correctly. Um, the intersection with the criminal justice system comes with its benefits, but it also comes with its, with, with its, with its weaknesses as well. And I think Mr. Drungo spoke to those quite, quite, um, quite clearly. Um, I, I don't, I think everybody acknowledges that intersectionality with criminal justice system, system has, has distinct challenges However, for the restorative justice framework to operate in a safe way, that intersectionality is, is equally important for us to be able to provide that risk information, to provide the, uh, a, a framework to, uh, for engagement with offenders um, to, to at least gauge where they are at. Um, I, I, don't know, I don't know what type of a framework could be designed without access to that information. Uh, and I think that Mr. Drumgold spoke to this earlier in the week as well, that, um, that there's nothing wrong with identifying these challenges and being clear eyed about it. But what, uh, what is the scaffolding that you need to put around those challenges to successfully overcome it? Um, and, and that is the key way of looking at the problems going forward to get to a positive outcome rather than just focusing on why it can't be done. Let's try and focus on what can be done. 
Thank you. Um, look, I'm mindful that um, we've got five minutes to go. We haven't had a lot of space for questions from the audience at this stage. Unless there was anything that any of you particularly want to add at this point, maybe we'll throw it open to the audience. Everybody agreed? Anybody got anything, any final comments? Okay. Uh, who is collating and moderating? Hi, Hannah. <laughs> oh, I've got quite a few questions here. So we'll try to get through as many as possible. Um, the first question um, is from Melinda. And the question is, is there a role for the federal government in supporting restorative justice? Who'd like to answer that? <laughs> I, I think there's a role for everybody in, in promoting uh, emotional resolution for, for crime. Um, I, I think certainly the federal government, of course, it's a, it's a difficult issue because uh, under um, the constitution, states and territories have control over the criminal justice, over their, their criminal justice systems, and it naturally sits comfortably in that space. Um, but uh, messaging should be consistent from, from each party that um, the role of reparation is a very fundamental role. Uh, so reparation is a very fundamental part of, criminal, uh, of the criminal justice system, regardless of the jurisdiction. Thank you. Anybody else like to answer that or we move on to the next question? I would just add, there's always a room for um, federal involvement when it comes to funding, but that would be the, that would be my contribution. Yes, bring it on. <laughs> All right, the next question we have is an anonymous question. Um, it says, if Mr Drumgold believes that restorative justice doesn't have a role in the criminal justice system, does this not show that the criminal justice system is not serving the public and survivor victims appropriately? Should we consider amending the objectives of criminal justice, for example, looking at Section 7 of the Crimes Act, focusing more on Section 7, 1D and 1G, which are promoting rehabilitation of the offender and recognising the harm done to the victim of crime in the community. These tend to align more with the goals of restorative justice. Um, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Uh, I, I don't think truth and reconciliation and reparation is mutually exclusive from a criminal justice system. What I'm saying is I have reservations about the ability of the criminal justice system being an adversarial process to deliver emotional resolution to victims and offenders. It doesn't mean that we can't pursue those things. It, it, it's just saying, I, I'm just saying that the criminal justice system is ill-equipped to achieve those things. Um, many other jurisdictions do, do have both systems sitting collateral. So they approach uh, restorative justice from a, um, as, as I say, from a truth and reconciliation perspective and the criminal justice system sits, off as, as sits alongside it. And I just add that the criminal justice system includes corrections and post-sentence referrals. So a lot of referrals might happen at that space after the tensions and the uh, I guess, question mark around motivations of the person responsible <clears throat> are out of the way. <clears throat> However, um, it does, you know, the potential is there for it to happen and it can happen, but it just makes it harder, I think, for participants to be coming without pressure and, and um, with the best possibility to be completely honest and open. Um, can I speak to that as well, Amanda? Uh, yes. I think that everybody has been very clear that any type of framework safety would have to be one of the the key um the key objectives of of the framework but accessibility is just as important and when we take when we look at who it is that is involved in the criminal justice system once a matter hits court it's not accessible if we're just looking at those people um, so uh, i think accessibility of this of whatever system um, for all people that are affected by sexual assaults, not just those that progress through the criminal justice system, needs to be a key factor that's being, that's being considered. Any other questions? Um, I've got two questions here that I might sort of combine into one. 
One is what level of screening is done on a perpetrator's suitability to participate in a restorative justice process? And similarly, can restorative justice be used in instances of reoffending, or does this automatically exclude the um, offender from the process and move to a more formal criminal justice prosecution? Perhaps I'll answer that first part. So the, there's an enormous amount of um, preparation, screening, risk assessment when referrals come in to the restorative justice unit. So information's gathered from criminal justice um, agencies, um, communications had with um, survivor and victim support agencies to try and figure out what's the safest way to make contact. Um, so there's a, it's a collaborative effort and um, obviously the survivor has to be in the um, front seat and making decisions, but there also needs to be a really um, clear understanding of what some of those risk elements might be in a matter. So um, for a matter to be um, found suitable, there's, there's all sorts of interviews, you know, we, you, you're interviewing um, parties, you're interviewing um, potential supporters. So you're looking at how um, a process might be um, unsafe psychologically, unsafe physically. Uh, and then you're, you know, we have uh, case tracking and case um, reviews and then a final suitability where everything is, um, you know, uh, undergone <coughs> um, in, a, in a complete review and then a decision is made. But usually that'll be one that, that is prioritising the needs and interests of the survivor. What was the second part of that question? Sorry, the second part was, um, sorry, just give me a moment. Um, how restorative justice can be considered for people that are reoffending if it is appropriate to be used in this context or whether um, people who have a history of offending are moved towards a more prosecutorial pathway? Well, um, what we have to remember is that for each offence there might be a separate victim who needs to have an opportunity to access restorative justice. If um, somebody is offending against the same victim, uh, restorative justice offers opportunities to be acknowledging patterns of behaviour. It doesn't, unlike the criminal justice system, it doesn't have to stick to this one incident that's come or been referred. So it's really important that the bigger picture does come out. Did anyone else want to speak to any, any parts of that question? I, ideally, um, repeat offenders, perpetrators, um, while they are being, um, like, whatever their sentence is, whether that's incarceration or um, the community um, stuff, while they, but particularly while they are in custody, there should be some level of rehabilitation. There should be some level of some kind of restorative work already existing, not necessarily in a more formal restorative justice capacity, but rehabilitation, um, education, work being done. Um, I think we have a responsibility in our systems that house these um, perpetrators have a responsibility to um, do what they can while they have them for the time they have them to then release them back to community in a, a better state than when they went in. And often restorative justice works really well when, <clears throat> if that person is in um, on a community-based order or is in prison, they already have a rehabilitation um, plan in place and restorative justice might be that an agreement comes out of that for them to address that and, and attend the, that and pay attention to changing their behaviour or changing their attitudes around that. Um, in another context, you know, it might be that an agree RJ agreement alone carries the wishes of the survivor for things that the person responsible can do, and, and they may agree to that agreement and, and follow that, and that will, their, their compliance, if you like, or their um, addressing that is then followed up by restorative justice conveners. Sometimes we find that if it's, if it's a plan, an agreement that's been, um, that the person responsible has participated in and agreed to and sees as, as useful, they're much more likely to follow through um, with that. I'm mindful we've gone five minutes over now. Were there other questions, Hannah? There's several other questions, but in the interest of time, perhaps we should just move on. 
Okay. Well, thank you so much to all the panelists, um, Claudia, Shane, Mick and Leah for participating today. Your perspectives and views have been um, a great addition to the day. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Amanda. So um, thank you very much to all of the panellists from all of the, the panels. We are um, going to hand over to Heidi Yates, who is the, um, the ACT uh, uh, Victims of Crime Commissioner, uh, who has kindly agreed to say a few concluding remarks. So over to you, Heidi. Great, thank you so much. And um, what a great few hours discussion we've had this morning. And I've listened in to that discussion from where I am on Ngunnawal and Ambri land. And I acknowledge uh, and pay my respects to the traditional custodians of this land. In doing so, I particularly thank the Aboriginal women uh, who have contributed to, the, to the, today's discussion. And locally, Paula McGrady, Leah House, and from a distance, Tracy Harris and Michelle Kelly. Thank you um, for the many years of advice and wisdom that you've shared with me and continue to do so about how we need to do business better. I also note um, that it's appropriate to wish you all a very happy Wear It Purple Day. And I don't know how many of you have found something purple to wear today, um, but such an important moment to pause as we work to foster a supportive and empowering um, environments for our LGBTIAQ plus young people and their families. So we've covered a lot of ground today um, and it's such a privilege to have wise minds from around the country and indeed around the world to bring thoughts together as we contemplate how to better, ins better ensure that justice responses, including restorative practice, are indeed responsive to the express views of survivors in all their diversity and as Nina said, at every point in the survivor journey. A key theme that I think appeared across conversations today is a resounding agreement that we know in the ACT and indeed across Australia, we are not currently responding consistently and well to survivors in all their diversity, um, both in terms of the services and supports that are available, but also the more formal justice options. And that, that is particularly so for our First Nations people. Um, noting that the justice system has since colonisation been used as a tool to oppress and control Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and perhaps at best to underprotect and over-police uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We've also touched on the limited interventions and accountability options in terms of working with people who use sexual violence. We all appear generally to agree on the fact that anything which increases options for survivors, including access to restorative options, both as part of a criminal justice response, but also outside without requiring engagement with the criminal justice system, um, is a good thing. That said, we've also been frank about the kinds of pressures that can be applied to victim survivors in different contexts when they're exploring options. Um, recognising uh, those pressures might be particularly distinct when, for example, an institution where the abuse has occurred uh, might indeed prefer and apply significant pressure to someone to choose um, a non-public option. But we've also talked about some of the different models and ways that restorative practice could be used, as I've said, both within and external to the criminal justice process. Um, and I can't help just uh, popping in here the ACT's new legislative charter of rights for victims and the fact that it does require justice agencies to inform victim survivors at multiple points in the systems about their rights and options regarding accessing a restorative process. I think that um, Meredith and Miranda will share my hope that through these long discussions today, um, that we have hopefully strengthened or built new connections between networks of people who are interested in doing this work. And we certainly uh, hope that you take your learnings, your reflections, um, perhaps your frustrations and ideas about solutions back to your workplaces, to your uh, colleagues and to other places where you may apply influence to ensure that we're talking about these things in our consideration of how our jurisdictions respond to sexual violence. So what happens next? Well, when it comes to next steps, 
you might be aware that locally here in the ACT, and I know in other states and territories around Australia, particularly in Victoria and Queensland, uh, we are doing a new body of work in relation to analysing how the ACT responds to sexual violence. Um, we've been fortunate that that body of work was launched um, by seven ministers a couple of months ago and with public tripartisan support, so we've got a strong platform from which to work. And though there are a series of working groups currently meeting uh, weekly for several hours each week and working, some might say somewhat chaotically in relation to just the sheer volume of material that those working groups are trying to get through, looking at prevention, response, law reform, and also specifically workplace related issues in the context of sexual violence. So um, this work, the discussions that we've had today, and with the help of many of you who are on those working groups and through Meredith and Miranda and their colleagues at the ANU, will feed directly into that platform for discussion and action, noting that um, the working groups will be producing clear recommendations back to the ACT government across all of those seven ministerial portfolios uh, regarding where we need to draw focus in the coming year regarding improving um, the ACT's response, uh, ACT's ability to prevent and respond to sexual violence. Meredith and Miranda have also invited me to remind you that they are ready and willing to engage with you beyond today on these issues and to warmly encourage you to reach out to them with your thoughts, your research, um, your perhaps shared frustrations and your ideas about where we might go next around finding solutions to how we might make restorative practice more available, appropriate, accessible and culturally responsive uh, in the ACT and beyond. Uh, they also asked me to advise you that they'll be circulating a link to a recording of the symposium, as well as a Dropbox folder with some additional relevant resources that may be of assistance. So I hope that you will join me in thanking Meredith and Miranda for all of their hard yards in so rapidly pulling this symposium together and shifting it online, of course, once the ACT lockdown hit. Thank you also to Richard and Amanda for your facilitating of panels today. And to all those speakers um, who have joined us, to all those who have asked questions and made comments and engaged, thank you for the generous and creative mindset that you have brought to these discussions. Thank you to the panellists for your time, particularly those who are based in COVID-struck environments where we know frontline services are incredibly busy at this time. Finally, I know that many of us hope and expect that today's conversation will be a platform for action. Noting that our research and our discussions about these matters are of best assistance to survivors when they crystallise into better practice services and supports. Let's make sure we turn these discussions into strong actions. And thank you for your time, your energy. I hope you have a great rest of your Wear It Purple day. Back to you, organising team. Thanks so much, Heidi. I think you've um, set it off really well. And, and we won't say much other than um, just reiterating how much we appreciate the generosity of spirit that everyone's brought to, to this discussion today. It's been really fantastic. And also just to recognize that we acknowledge the limitations of this format and that we haven't been able to get to all, um, a number of really good questions and discussions that, that still remain open. Um, there's only so much we can go over in four hours. <laughs> And we would invite all attendees and panelists to, to continue a conversation with us and, 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 and to, um, to feel, feel free to get in touch. But other than that, I think, um, Miranda, if you have anything else to say, I'm happy to end this webinar and, and thank you again to everyone. Really, really warm, deep thanks. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>